some formal or introductions or greetings in a moment once we get some videos rolling. We do have some interesting things to show today and pretty excited because like there's so much talk about like the carbon rebate and the carbon tax and what the discrepancy is there. I thought we would take a look at different stories that a few uh, platforms have done. Look at some independents, look at CBC. We're going to start out with CBC just because I want to see how much they lean towards uh, the liberals and, and Trudeau's idea. Anyway, we're going to jump right in and then I'll catch and see who's in the room and say hello to everyone. So let's get this going. One of the most common questions I hear about the carbon tax in Canada is how much does it cost me? Sometimes it's difficult. Because it's very, very too expensive. I think it's kind of crazy to be giving back money when why put it on in the first place. So let's cut through all the uncertainty and just try to solve this little math problem. Starting with how much is the carbon tax? The tax is really a charge on fuel. And this is a list of fuels where you pay the carbon tax. The second column, how many extra cents you pay per unit. But, Hello, everybody. How's uh, everyone doing? You don't find Hi, Sheila. How are you? Hello, Elizabeth. Hey, Kirk. Or Lightning NASA. Rod, what's up? Good Wait, to see you, Joan. I don't actually know what that is. Sunshine 333, what is up? To show the four fuels that are probably more Hello, Janet, what's up? Gasoline, light fuel oil, aka diesel, propane, and natural gas. So, just an example, you've got your cute little car, you're filling, let's call it a 50 liter tank of gas. As of April 1st, the carbon tax is about 17.6 cents per liter. You do the math, you're paying an extra $8.81 for a full tank. Uh, let's do the same calculation. Let's call it for diesel fuel, let's say 100 liters, for an extra 21.4 cents a liter. That's the carbon tax as of April 1st. You're paying an extra 21.40. Home heating is the other big fuel expense many of us have. The good news, if you get your heat from hydroelectricity, there's no carbon tax on that. If you use home heating oil, you probably live in Atlantic Canada, you get a three-year pause on the carbon tax. But natural gas, how much you use to heat your home, really depends on the size of your home. This is uh, a pretty small one. But according to government figures, the average Canadian who uses natural gas at home uses around 88 gigajoules, or expressed differently, 2,400 cubic meters of natural gas. That's per year. At an extra 15 cents per cubic meter, thanks to the carbon tax, hey Bob, what's that's up? an Good extra see, man. $360 per year, or that works out to about 30 bucks a month. So that's the quick and dirty on what the carbon tax costs you directly. What about how much you get back? So every three months in January, April, July, and October, you get a quarterly rebate from the federal government, each covering three months worth of payments. The short answer for how much you get back is just look at what you got back. <laughs> Some people get checks mailed to them. Most will get a direct deposit. When you check your statement, the government is trying to get banks to all call the rebate the same thing, the Canada carbon rebate, but banks do what they want to do. And historically, we've seen these rebates labeled as EFT deposit from Canada or Canada Fed or some combination of these words. But here's what that looks like for the eight provinces who pay the tax. You can see the larger your household, the more money you get back. And it ranges at the low end from $95 for a single person living alone in New Brunswick to $450 if you're a family of four in Alberta. The key here, though, is that the amount you get has nothing to do with how much carbon tax you paid. It's a flat amount. So imagine someone who doesn't drive, doesn't barbecue, heats their home with electricity. They might not pay any carbon tax at all. And every three months, they get a big fat check. The people who pay for that check, in theory, are those who consume a lot of fuel and pump a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. They're paying a ton of tax, and their rebate will be comparatively small. We are incentivized to substitute away from those things if we can. 
the estimate from the government and the parliamentary budget office is that most Canadians, as many as 80% of us, will earn more from the rebate than we directly pay in carbon taxes, especially because the size of the rebate keeps going up in lockstep with the size of the tax. But is that the end of the story? Not a chance, because we need to ask, what does this calculation miss? Let's turn back to the parliamentary budget office. Now, this is a lot of numbers. I get it. But hey, Kumi, hey, Terry, what's up? How are you guys? Of who Good comes to see you. out ahead based on income. Income is factored in because the more you make, the more they figure you spent in fuel. Bigger car, bigger house, you get the idea. And they use 2030 as a reference here, by the way, because that's when both the tax and the rebate top out at their maximums. But let's add some color. So if you live in Alberta and you're in the bottom 20% of income earners, the PBO estimates this whole carbon pricing scheme will make you $870 a year. In fact, the lowest income earners in every province are expected to make more money than they spend. This is also true in the second quintile of income earners and most of the third and fourth. It's only the wealthiest 20% of people who are expected to pay more through the carbon tax than they make back in the rebate. And I actually haven't seen too many people dispute these particular numbers. I mean, it's not a matter of belief, it's a matter of data. And that's what our StatScan data tells us. So what explains then the opposition leader, Pierre Polyev, when he says things like this? They're pouring more fuel on the inflationary flames with a April Fool's Day carbon tax. Critics point out that no matter how you horse trade dollars and cents, the carbon tax makes fuel more expensive. You pay more at the pump. You just do. And when prices go up in a broad way for a broad set of people, that's inflation. So the carbon tax plus what's been happening to, to money has driven up prices and caused an increase in inflation, which is coming back down. But it's, so, but it, it's certainly the case that if you were to remove the, the carbon tax altogether, you would see somewhat of a reduction in prices. What hard data evidence do you have that the carbon tax is a major significant driver of inflation in Canada? So what did data do I have showing that the carbon tax drives up the cost of living? Well, the Bank of Canada. So the Bank of Canada, the governor has already said that the carbon tax contributes to inflation. Yeah, so he's not wrong, but this is misleading. Turns out the governor of the Bank of Canada did weigh in on this exact point last year. And you know what he came up with? Very squeaky marker, 0.15%. That 0.15% of the inflation rate at the time, that's how much was directly attributable to the carbon tax. So yes, Oliev is correct. Any increase in price raises the cost of living, but in this case, seemingly not by an appreciable amount. And of course, this ignores the fact Here comes that most the CBC of us get part. that extra money back eventually. So this argument that the carbon tax drives inflation, pushing the cost of living beyond reasonable limits, doesn't quite hold up, or does it? We know very simply when you raise the cost of the gas and diesel that our farmers use to produce the food and that our truckers use to ship the food, you raise the price of the food itself. Somebody has to pay that price. It is magical thinking to suggest that you can raise energy prices on businesses, farmers and workers without raising inflation. So now we're hitting on the wonderfully messy, murky territory one must wade into when we're trying to gauge whether individually you and I pay more or less. Hey Sandy, what's up? Time. How are you? He has a point. It's just founded on a bunch of inaccuracies. Polyev's point is founded in part on a second major finding in the Parliamentary Budget Office, which I'll show you. In this set of calculations, the PBO tries to work out not just the direct cost of what we all pay for the carbon tax when we buy fuel, but also the indirect costs of more expensive fuel, making everything more expensive. If you're, you're economizing on your use of energy, 
then your other inputs into your manufacturing, your, your production process are going to become less efficient, less productive. So if you reduce the productivity of labor, the main driving force behind wages is labor productivity. So if labor becomes less productive because it's got less other outputs to work with, then uh, real wages are going to increase more slowly or go down. So let's add in the green and red. This is the very different picture critics are talking about. The average Canadian emerging a net loser. Oh, it seems like it's going higher, always. Well, it went down a little, so I'm happy about that. But uh, other than that, I mean, yeah, it's a lot. But again, according to these experts, this doesn't account for a few really glaring things. The fuel that What's farmers up, Mr. Pickles? use to How are you today? produce the fuel, most of that fuel is exempt from carbon pricing. And so 95-ish percent of on-farm emissions are unpriced by any of the federal systems. Farmers, fishermen, truckers, who all bring us food will be paying more and passing on those prices at the grocery store to Canadians who are already starving. Between 2021 and 2023, that bump up in inflation had almost nothing to do with the carbon price. That bump up in inflation happened in countries that don't have carbon pricing. It happened in all kinds of countries and it happened for reasons completely unrelated to the carbon price. So I completely understand why people in the upper 20% of the income distribution are saying they are worse off economically or financially. Okay, that's correct. But the second part of this is Keep in mind what we're trying to do. The point I hear again and again is that even if the government's price on carbon does end up costing Canadians some above zero number of dollars, setting that as the bar for what makes a good or bad plan to fight climate change. What's up, Dino? Really How you doing, man? Reality. Good to see you. We are trying to slowly over time transition our economy from one that's incredibly emissions intensive. I don't think it's fair to compare a carbon pricing world with a world where we just don't do anything about climate change. You know, when we talk about the PBO reports, it's really important to understand that those are not carbon pricing versus a bunch of other stuff. It's carbon pricing versus nothing. All initiatives cost taxpayer money, whether that's through a carbon tax, subsidies, industry incentives, like the government sneezes and that probably costs you money. But carbon pricing, I mean, that's in your face, right? You pay it every day. So it makes sense that it really hits a nerve. Is it a net loss to your bank account? Maybe. Is it a greater net loss than any other comparable plan? That's less clear. Okay, so um, that's the first piece that we have to look at. And I do find it kind of interesting to see what they're saying. But now let's look at what an independent news organization is saying about the same thing, just to see the difference. After that, we have some other interesting pieces to check out. Um, we're going to get into Bill C-63 after, but we're going to review again, just to see, like, that's the way the CBC does it. Fine. Let's see how an independent uh, journalist handles the exact Hey, taxpayers. Story. So you've likely noticed that the cost of pretty much everything is going through the roof. Uh, lots of things are to blame for that, including our runaway inflation, which is largely caused by the actions of government printing too much money. We have increasing interest rates, which is again attached to the inflation problem. But you know what the government has a direct effect on? Taxes. That's right especially things like carbon taxes. Carbon taxes are costing you a ton of money right now. And I want to break it down for you and tell you exactly how much it's costing you. So right now, the carbon tax is $50 per ton federally. On average, that adds around 11 cents per liter of gasoline. What does that mean in the real people world? Well, that means that when you go to the gas station and you fill up your family minivan, it costs you $8 extra just in the carbon tax to fill that thing up. Now that's real that's money. A lot of money. I can buy a roast chicken for $8. Yeah. If you have a pickup truck, that's $13 extra just in the carbon tax. 
one of those big rig trucks, the ones that deliver all of our groceries, the stuff we eat, and all of our essentials, the supplies that we use, that costs around $120 extra in the carbon tax because, of course, that hits diesel. Now, actually, quite often, our goods and supplies are on a train in Canada as well. How much does it cost in carbon tax to fill up a diesel train? It costs around $2,400 extra in the carbon tax to fill up a diesel train. This is what we're talking about when we talk about the layering cost of the carbon tax. That is why people often call it the tax on everything, because there's a lot of layers to the carbon tax that we don't see, but we sure notice it when we're at the cash register. Now, keep in mind the carbon tax isn't just on stuff that we use to fill up our cars. The carbon tax punishes us for heating our homes. Yes, the federal carbon tax adds 9.8 cents per cubic meter for natural gas, 7.7 .7 cents per liter of propane, and 15.9 cents per liter of furnace oil. Yes, some folks still do use that to heat their homes. We put out a call a while back to our supporters, asking them to send us their heating bills from the winter. Hey, Gracie, we wanted to, to do that Welcome so we could channel. get an idea, Hello, on average, you? of how much Peach, fuel folks are using to heat their homes during the winter, and therefore, of course, how much it costs them in the carbon tax. Buckle up. The family bills for the carbon tax for propane, for example, for one month was $77 to heat their home in the winter. For natural gas, it was $105. Again, this is just for one month. And for furnace oil, it was actually an older couple who relied on their furnace oil. They had to get it filled up twice a month in Ottawa. That cost them around $70 just in the carbon tax. So you got to figure with all these compounded costs of the transportation and delivering our goods and the heating of our homes, that that would be enough carbon tax pain and punishment. But actually not. Farmers actually have to pay the carbon tax to dry grain. How do they do that? They use propane and natural gas to do that. What eats grain? Pretty much everything. So again, that's the extra added layer of expense of the carbon tax. Now, before some of our friends across the dinner table try to say things like, well, you'll get more back than you pay out. Number one, we know that's silly. <laughs> the government does not have a magical money appreciation machine. It's not like an investment that we make and they're going to be able to give us more money back. No, that's not how this works. So number one, that's nonsense. Number two, the parliamentary budget officer also found that that's indeed nonsense. Even after all of these factors are brought into the equation, even after the federal rebates are mailed out, Canadian families are still out typically hundreds of dollars by the end of the year because of the carbon tax. And folks, it's just going to get worse if we don't do something. The Trudeau government is planning on more than tripling the current carbon tax within the next eight years. Yes, right now it's $50. They want to put it up to $170 by the year 2030. And we know that year is going to be here before we know it. But actually, there's one, there's a hit that's coming in even sooner. He's going to jack up the first carbon tax this April. Okay, he's going to increase it by 15 bucks a ton. And two, he's going to impose a second carbon tax on Canadians. On average, that's going to cost between an extra 9 and 11 cents per litre of gasoline, depending on where they land on this thing. This is a government fuel regulation that's tucked into their rules, but it's essentially a second carbon tax. British Columbia has had a second carbon tax for years, and it costs around 17 cents a litre of gasoline. That's one of the reasons why British Columbia is leading the parade on this unaffordability journey that we're all on here. So what can we do about this? Well, it's essential for you to stand up and be heard. It is essential for you to fight back. If you cannot afford these cascading effects of the carbon taxes, you need to pick up the phone and you also need to send an email to your member of parliament. Go to parl.gc.ca, P-A-R-L dot G-C dot C-A. That's the federal government's website. Look up what your member of parliament is, where, who they are. Just type in your postal code. It'll pop right up. Send them an email. Hey, Patty, what's in up? fact, LOL, send them your grocery bill. You? Send them What's a copy on, of your heating Good bill. Highlight the carbon tax on it. 
Tell them that you won't stand for this anymore, that you can't afford this, and that you expect them to scrap the carbon taxes. You can also join our fight. We have a big petition right now on our website. If you go to our website, taxpayer.com, you can sign the petition against the federal carbon tax. That way you will join our standing army. And when we decide the push comes to shove and we do mass emailing campaigns and we do events, you'll be the first one on our list to let you know. You can also order one of these nifty bumper stickers to let other folks know exactly how you feel about the carbon tax. So head on over to our website, taxpayer.com. That's how you can help us fight for taxpayers. Yeah, so that's the second piece that we had to show. And again, just uh, I'm trying to get to the bottom of it for myself. I'm just trying to figure it out. Like, But you have uh, news stations like or broadcasters like CBC that are very partisan. And so, and again, not that the independents aren't partisan, they're mostly right, right wing people, but it's interesting to figure out, get two sides of the story to figure out what the real story is. This next piece is uh, on Bill C-63, which personally, that bill terrifies me, if you know anything about it. Uh, we're jumping right into that piece now. Hi, guys. So this go. is going to be my third video about a proposed law from the Trudeau government that I am really worried about. I'm worried that it is a full assault on freedom of expression and speech. You can watch my other videos about this law, which I will link to in the description below. But this video is going to be about the criminalization of speech in Bill C-63 and why this proposal is so extreme, it even applies to speech that hasn't even happened yet. Crazy? I, I know. Before I get into it, I know that a lot of you, like me, are really worried about this bill. And that's why we at the Canadian Constitution Foundation created an online letter that you can send to your member of parliament telling them to stop and fix Bill C-63. Over 6,000 of you have already written to your member of parliament. And if you want to write about your concerns as well, you still can. You can go to the ccf.ca slash fix C-63, which I will also link to below. Now, let's get into this new plan to criminalize speech, including speech that hasn't even happened yet. Hey, Minute, what's up? Good to see you. Happy Easter, belated. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Christine and I'm the litigation director at the Canadian Constitution Foundation, a legal charity that fights for fundamental freedoms in Canada. I upload regular videos about interesting developments in constitutional law in Canada and about our ongoing cases. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, hit like and subscribe below. It really helps my videos out a lot with the algorithm. Also, please remember that nothing in my videos is ever legal advice. If you have your own legal question or problem, please consult your own lawyer. What's so up, those of you who are How still are maybe catching up on what's happening, this proposal was introduced in February of this year, 2024, and it is formally called the Online Harms Act, but it goes far beyond regulating online harm. And one thing it does, which is the focus of this particular video, is make three major amendments to the criminal code. The first amendment is to specifically define the word hatred in the criminal code, which currently doesn't have a definition. The amendment would define hatred as the emotion that involves detestation or vilification and that is stronger than disdain or dislike. This definition, which in my opinion is really just a number of synonyms for hatred, it comes from the case law, including a Supreme Court case called Whatcott. And the legislation specifically says that speech will not meet the criteria of hatred just because it discredits, humiliates, hurts, or offends. But given the subjectivity of the definition and the fact that it's defined basically in reference to itself by using a bunch of synonyms, 
I have my concerns. The second major amendment proposed to the criminal code in Bill C-63 is to broaden the current categories of hate crime offenses to capture any offense under any act of parliament that's motivated by hatred based on a prohibited ground of discrimination. This is what some people are describing as the standalone offense, uh, an offense motivated by hatred. So currently, the hate crimes that already exist in the criminal code consist of prohibitions on willfully promoting or publicly inciting hatred. And there's actually pretty limited case law on incitement because the threshold for criminalizing speech is high. It should be high. This should be a high standard for a democracy to put someone in jail because of something that they said. But one of the concerns that I have about this new offense motivated by hatred proposal, and this isn't just my concern, a lot of scholars and practicing lawyers have the same con concern. We're worried that this new provision would turn any federal offense, not even just those found in the criminal code, into a potential hate crime. So those who commit offenses could be potentially liable for life imprisonment. So what if you engage in mischief and the government wants to allege that it was mischief motivated by hatred? Or what if you engage in vandalism and the government wants to argue it was vandalism motivated by hatred? That can exist as a major threat as part of the prosecution. It's a really radical proposal. Now, one of the people who has outlined some concerns about this is Professor Dwight Newman at the University of Saskatchewan School of Law, and he wrote about some of his concerns for the Fraser Institute. He wrote, I'm going to read you what he said. He said, consider a wayward 19 year old painting graffiti who could be accused of being motivated by hatred. He could now be charged with an offense carrying the possibility of life imprisonment. That wayward youth needs corrective intervention, which might appropriately Smith, include criminal up? conviction for mischief, but a threat of life imprisonment you, is totally disproportionate Sanjay, to the offense. You. And Ms. Professor Newman, Right, so this could have a spillover effect, a major problem of Truly, establishing potentially on? vague offenses with vastly disproportionate punishments is that they can be used as a threat to elicit plea bargains from people who should not have to plead out. So the government has this huge potential to say, if you don't plead guilty, we could pursue life imprisonment for this otherwise possibly minor criminal code offense. So Professor Newman goes on to say, if anything in the circumstances of an offense could be used to suggest that the offender was motivated by hatred, the offender is now deeply vulnerable to new pressures to simply plead guilty of something in return for avoiding charges on the threatened indictable offense. This problem particularly affects people from marginalized communities. Some of the very people the government purports to defend will suffer direct harm from the existence of this misconceived offense motivated by hatred. Now, Professor Newman is not alone in his criticism. Canadian literary icon Margaret Atwood posted on X about the, quote, possibilities for revenge, false accusations and thought crime stuff, which are so inviting. And she called it Trudeau's Orwellian online harms bill. And I think that she's absolutely right. But this is not where it ends. Those are just the first two amendments to the criminal code. The third major amendment is this restraint on future speech that I talked about in my introduction. So this amendment would allow individual Canadians with the attorney general's consent. So, you know, your friends or neighbors or people who aren't your friends, your enemies and neighbors, it could allow them to seek peace bonds against others whom they fear will commit a hate crime in the future. So under this provision, provincial court judges would be empowered to call these parties to appear before them and determine whether there's, quote, reasonable grounds to fear that the defendant, the accused person, will commit such a offense. And when the judge ultimately decides that an individual is reasonably likely to commit a hate crime at some point in the future, their powers are incredibly far reaching. Bill C-63 
uh, will allow a judge to issue peace bonds against individuals for up to 12 months that could require them to stop them from communicating with certain individuals or from consuming drugs and alcohol. It could place them under house arrest or uh, if if um, the attorney general is the one who has applied, it could require that they wear electronic monitoring devices like an ankle bracelet. So my friend, Chris Kinsinger, who's a lawyer and scholar, and he's the director of the Runnymede Society, he has called this particular provision, the the future speech provision, Bill C-63's most draconian provision. And I think that that says a lot, given that the other provisions of the bill are also very draconian, like the possibility of life imprisonment and the return of a civil remedy for hate speech, which is what my last video was about. So Chris wrote in an article for The Hub that this part of the bill, the part that applies to future speech, is what is called a prior restraint on speech. So in short, a prior restraint is a limitation on expression that doesn't just target the harmful effects of that expression, but seeks to prevent such expression from taking place at all. And this is a departure from the many other ways our law frequently limits expression, like the laws around libel, defamation, defamation, sedition, and even the current prohibitions on willfully promoting or publicly inciting hatred. Those are all intended to punish expression and speech after it has already occurred. By necessity, prior restraints censor expressive content by turning agents of the state into the licensors of permissible expression. And indeed, in this case, it's not even the state itself, it's society at large. Anyone who is worried can seek a peace bond against another person who they fear will commit a hate crime in the future. So I know nobody likes when things are interrupted, but well, this, this is going to be the plan. We have an interesting piece after this. We'll get back to the pretty young lady that's explaining things so that we can understand. But then we've got a great piece with Jordan Peterson. I know I've been overdoing the Jordan Peterson stuff, guys, but the reason for that is, is people love Jordan Peterson. I like Jordan Peterson a lot myself. I just find... It's confirmation bias for me because I'm like, oh, that guy thinks the same way I do. I'm attracted to that. Like, I don't mean like that kind of attraction. I just mean to the thoughts. That's all. Uh, anyways, back to the pretty young lady that's explaining this to us. And then we're jumping into Jordan Peterson. So... Sure. The yeah. evidence that Sorry judges that. who are faced with this question will consider uh, when deciding whether or not to issue one of these peace bonds will include the allegedly hateful content that the individual in question is expected to express. And it's by no means unreasonable to be worried that certain expressive content will be presumed to cause harm even where harm has not taken place, much less been proven on a balance of probabilities. The prior restraint issue is just one of the many problematic aspects of this proposed law, which, if passed, would be ripe for constitutional challenge. And that's a constitutional challenge that we at the CCF would really strongly consider bringing if the bill passes in its current form. But what do you think? What do you think is the biggest problem with this proposed law? Are you most worried about that squishy statutory definition of hatred? Are you most worried about the possibility of life imprisonment for crimes motivated by hatred or about the restraint on yet unspoken words? Or is there another part of the bill that concerns you most, like the amendments to the Canada Human Rights Act? Leave a comment below to let me know what you think the biggest problem is and make sure that you write to your member of parliament as well to let him or her know. If you want to keep up to date about what is happening with this bill, you can subscribe to our email updates at the ccf.ca slash freedom updates, or you can ring that notification bell icon, that little bell image right beside the subscribe button. If you ring that, you will get notified every time I have a new video out. And I'm going to be posting more videos about developments in this law, C63, as it makes its way through Parliament. Okay, that's all for this video. Thanks for watching and let's keep fighting for free. 
So, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, <clears throat> bad pause. So, the next video I'm going to show is a piece with Jordan Peterson. It goes on. I'm sorry. I find it distracting. Like, also, I always want people to be honest with me here in the comments, um, in the chat. But I like Jordan Peterson, and I'm going to show a piece of that. And then we have a regular question period from 2020 that I find really interesting. I've seen it before. Um, and here we go with some Jordan Peterson. Freedom in Canada. Well, sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, goodness gracious. Sorry, everybody. My cat is in the way of my screen so we're just trying to fix that up now we're going to jump into uh this is a canadian house of commons question period from 2020 and how the times have changed so dramatically in just a very short period of time like it's nuts questions um, oral oral questions the honorable opposition house leader this was before, before the information Pierre revealed in the tapes last week proved that the Prime Minister has not been telling the truth. The Prime Minister not only had the knowledge about the pressure being applied on the former Attorney General, but he and his office were in fact orchestrating it. Wow. As the clerk said, the Prime Minister wanted his way and he was going to get it. Now I know I'm not allowed to say that the Prime Minister lied, so my question is this. <laughs> Why did the Prime Minister give deceitful and false information to Canadians regarding the pressure he and his office applied to the former attorney general. The honorable opposition house leader knows that you can't do indirectly what you can't do directly, so I'd ask her to be careful with that. The honorable government house leader. Mr. Speaker, it's important that Canadians be reminded that the Prime Minister gave unprecedented access to the former Attorney General. He waived sister client privilege as well as cabinet confidence. It's also important to note that the Prime Minister has taken responsibility for the breakdown of communication within his office as well as with the clerk of the Privy Council. It's important to note that the Justice Committee we looked at this matter for over five weeks. They actually held meetings in public so that Canadians could hear. And it's also important to note that the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner is currently studying this matter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are not buying the ever-changing saga that the Prime Minister is trying to peddle. First of all, he said there's nothing to see here. All allegations are false. Then second, we all heard it's Scott Bryson's fault. And now the blame is being placed and was placed on the former Attorney General. It was all her fault yeah. for not saying never, no yeah. loudly and clearly yeah, enough to the Prime Minister. When, we're, when we heard the tapes and all of us heard, she said no to the Prime Minister. Yeah, so yeah. why does the Prime Minister just start telling, stop telling us just his perspective and tell us the truth? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Government House Leader. Continue pointing fingers and trying to divide Canadians. What we know is that it's important for Canadians to be able to hear, and that's exactly why the Justice Committee sat down. They have members from both sides of the aisle on committee. They set parameters, and within those parameters, they asked the former Attorney General to appear. For the entire time that the former Attorney General was the Attorney General, the Prime Minister gave unprecedented access to ensure that uh, solicitor client privilege was waived as well as cabinet confidence so that Canadians could hear directly from witnesses. Is. The Justice Committee actually studied this matter over five weeks. The Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner is currently studying this matter. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. But Mr. Yeah. Speaker, it was the Prime Minister who instructed the Liberal MPs on the Justice and Ethics Committee to shut down the investigation. Yeah, down. And you know what? They complied. But now, after we've heard the tapes, just yesterday, guess who said he's got more information to oh, give? Yeah. Gerald Butts. Oh. It is clear there is much more to this scandal. There is more information, and it comes right from the Prime Minister and from his office. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister allow his Liberal MPs on the Justice Committee to reopen this important investigation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Government House Leader. 
Justice Committee will make those decisions for themselves. What's clear is by having uh, submissions to committee that the system actually does work. So when the former Attorney General was at committee and testified that the rule of law in Canada is intact, that Canadians can have confidence in their institutions, this once again proves that the work that committees do will continue to function. So the former Attorney General was able to submit new information, as were others, and I think it's important that they get to do their important work. Let's not undermine the work of our institutions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, for nearly two months, the PM's interference scandal and his office has dragged on. On day one, he d denied this whole true story, and then he changed his version of events every week. Since Friday, we have an audio recording and written recordings that clearly confirm that the PM and his office have interfered, and they tried to cover up this scandal. So what will the, be the PM's new version of events today, or will he finally tell Canadians the truth? The Honourable House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we always tell Canadians the truth, and that's uh, also true for the members of the Justice Committee and the witnesses. Witnesses came, they, tes they testified, and now these facts are all public. It's important for Canadians to have the opportunity to hear for themselves, uh, and that is why the PM waived uh, Cabinet confidence so that the witnesses could ap appear and testify. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthur Basker. Mr. Speaker, the PM refused a public inquiry. He refused to testify at the Justice Committee. He refused that all witnesses involved uh, be able to testify. The Liberals themselves are saying that there was interference. They, we didn't invent this. The Liberals are sitting right here in this House now, and all we're asking them is to waive uh, uh, solicitor client privilege so we can hear the whole story. Jerry Butts has other documents to submit, and do we have the whole truth? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, to make sure Canadians can hear the truth, uh, well, that's why we waived Cabinet confidence and solicitor kind privilege. Nothing on this file was off limits. What the com Justice Committee asked is what they received. And the Conservatives have continued to not listen to what witnesses have said. And on this side of the House, we respect our institutions, and we're going to continue to do so. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Westminster Burnaby. All that the Prime Minister has said in, for 12, uh, two months has been disproved, and the audio recording was made public uh, on this uh, essence scandal that involving the Prime Minister. The very principles that underpin our democracy are at stake, the rule of law, the independence of our judiciary, and equality in terms of Canadians, Canada's institutions. The Prime Minister has lost his credibility. We need a public inquiry. Will the government start one now? The Honourable House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we know that the members sitting on the Justice Committee have studied this file and the Prime Minister did waive cabinet confidence and solicitor-client privilege so that the former Attorney General could testify. And we know that the committees are doing their work and we know that the Ethics commis Commissioner is doing his work because there is an inquiry underway right now and we are going to respect their work. But I think that the NDP should know that once one of their MPs that asked for more documents, and that is exactly why the former uh, AG did give them. This scandal is not going away. Every day there is fresh evidence that the Prime Minister and his chief advisers misled this House and misled Canadians. And no evidence so far has been as compelling and as devastating to the Prime Minister's case as the audio recording that Canadians heard this weekend. The Prime Minister should stop hiding or trying to talk his way out of this. He needs to do the right thing. Will he come clean with Canadians by calling a public inquiry now? Here, here. Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, the Justice Committee sat and they had witnesses appear. At every step, the opposition, including the NDP, said that the committee wouldn't meet. Witnesses wouldn't appear. They said that the former Attorney General would not be able to speak uh, and share her story. The Prime Minister waived solicitor client privilege as well as Cabinet Conference to ensure that Canadians could hear everything that they should get to hear because we believe that that is exactly how it should be. The former Minister also confirmed that she had nothing further to offer a formal process. That's within her testimony, and we know that all facts are now on the table. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Disnethy, Miss Nethy, Churchill River. Last Wednesday, the Prime Minister and his Liberal Party friends laughed at the members of Grassy Narrows First Nation as they were thrown out of an exclusive fundraiser. They had no other chance to ask him directly for justice after decades of mercury poisoning in their community. Apologies from the Prime Minister aren't good enough anymore. Chief Randy Turtle doesn't accept the Prime Minister's apology because his community needs actions and not words. Will the Prime Minister commit to visiting Grassy Narrows immediately? Here, here. Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. I thank the member for her question and for her advocacy. The people of Grassy Narrows have suffered for generations. We continue to work with the community to support their needs and remain steadfast in our commitment to build a health facility in the community. The minister is looking forward to meeting with Chief Turtle to determine how we can continue moving this critical work forward. It's imperative that we all work together, the government of Canada, the province and the community, to ensure that the people of Grassy Narrows get the support they need like they didn't under 10 years of that government that's doing all the heckling. The Honourable Member for saint hyacinthe Pago. Mr. Speaker, they expect more. Members of the Grassy Narrows First Nations are asking for justice after decades of mercury poisoning in their community. Last week, the Prime Minister mocked them when he th they were thrown out of his fundraiser. This is not leadership. Leadership is engaging with people. It's going to Grassy Narrows and seeing what people are experiencing. It's keeping one's promises. The Prime Minister's apology is not enough. Will he commit to visit visiting Grassy Narrows immediately? Uh, the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the residents of Grassy Narrows have suffered for generations and we're going to continue to work with this community to meet their needs and we remain faithful to our commitment to establish a health institution in their community. The minister would be happy to meet with uh, minister, uh, Leader Turtle to determine how we continue to advance this crucial work. For Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister told Canadians that no one ever raised concerns with him about his many attempts to interfere in the criminal prosecution of SNC-Lavalin. But the recorded phone call and text messages released last week prove that's blatantly false. The former Attorney General told the Prime Minister and his top officials that their actions were, quote, entirely inappropriate, repeatedly. Both his top political advisor and top public servant have resigned in disgrace. When will the Prime Minister stop changing his story and tell Canadians the truth. The Honourable Government House Leader. We believe that Canadians should get to hear exactly what's taking place, and that's why all Justice Committee member meetings took place in public. And that's also why the Prime Minister um, waived solicitor client privilege as well as Cabinet confidence to ensure that when witnesses appear, they would be able to share their testimony. Canadians are listening and able to engage. We know that additional documents have been provided that actually substantiate and just confirm exactly what the testimony had been thus far. Mr. Speaker, it shows that the, the system is working and that people are able to submit documents and that's exactly how it should work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
member for Lakeland. But the Prime Minister didn't fully remove the restraints, and new information and evidence has been submitted to the committee, so clearly their work isn't done. The Prime Minister also told Canadians to heed Michael Wernick's words, and oh, we did. The recording proves Wernick threatened the former Attorney General if she did not do the Prime Minister's bidding and stop the independent criminal prosecution of SNC-Lavalin. Clearly, the PM knew all along and directed the coordinated campaign to bully the Attorney General to interfere, and he was told it was wrong over and over. When will the Prime Minister finally tell Canadians the truth? Well, Government House Leader. Gave unprecedented uh, waivers for, so that the information could be shared in public, so that Canadians could hear directly from themselves. Nothing related to the matter was off limits. The waiver actually covered the entire time of the former Attorney General's entire term, and it covers the whole period during which the allegations were made. Members that sit on the Justice Committee they set parameters for the study to ensure that that study would be able to be done to the best. Uh, the Prime Minister waives solicitor client privilege as well as cabinet confidence, so that Canadians could hear exactly for themselves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Au Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has asked Canadians to listen to Michael Vernick, and we did so. He said that the former Attorney General did not raise her concerns to him with regard to negotiating a plea deal with SNC-Lavalin, but we now know that she did so on several occasions. Canadians aren't buying this, and they realize that the PM has no credibility in this affair. When will the Prime Minister stop changing his story and tell Canadians the truth? The Honourable House, Government House Leader. The PM waived solicitor client privilege and cabinet confidence so that those who have information can speak openly. This is unprecedented. This file, nothing was off limits on this file, and the waiver applied to the whole mandate of the former uh, Attorney General. It was the whole period of time during which there were allegations. All the facts have now, are now public, and the Ethics Commissioner is continuing his work and a file is open. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charbourg, Au Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, the government is controlling the Justice Committee and they want to hear what they want to hear. There was 11 witnesses that were asked by the opposition that were refused. Uh, the Prime, Prime Minister, does he realize the, the danger of uh, undermining the justice system? We don't live in a dictatorship. The are we supposed to believe that nothing has happened? When will he stop misleading Canadians? We want to know the truth. The Honourable Government House Leader, Canadians have to be able to hear the truth, and that is exactly why the Prime Minister waived solicitor client privilege and cabinet confidence so that witnesses could appear and share their testimony. We know that the Canadians will have every opportunity to look at all the proceedings of the Justice Committee because they were public. And we know that our members sitting on the Justice Committee are doing their work, and we see that the, the Conservatives are taking uh, directions from their leading, leader, and that's the only, the only way they operate. February, the Prime Minister said, I would recommend that people pay close heed to the words of the Clerk of the Privy Council. Last Friday, Canadians did just that when they heard the Clerk carrying out orders from the Prime Minister pressuring the former Attorney General to cut SNC Lavalin a special deal. The tape makes it clear that political interference in an ongoing criminal proceeding was happening at the highest levels of this government. The tape doesn't lie. So why doesn't the Prime Minister start telling? Telling the truth. Yeah. Honorable Government House Leader. Hear the truth, and that's exactly why Justice Committee members were able to have their meetings in public. That's a decision they took, and that's what took place. The Prime Minister waived solicitor client privilege as well as cabinet confidence because Canadians do deserve to be able to hear the truth. It's also important to note that the former Attorney General said that the rule in Canada, in law, the rule of law in Canada, is intact, and that the rule of law was followed. And the Prime Minister recognizes that we can always improve our institutions, and that's why he accepted responsibilities for the breakdown of communication and trust within his office and we put measures to move forward 
in an even better way, we will continue to deliver for Canadians. Whether, yeah, remember for Chilliwack Hope. The tape makes it clear that the Prime Minister was demanding a special deal for SNC-Lavalin. We heard the clerk clearly when he said that the Prime Minister is going to find a way to get it done one way or another. He's in that kind of mood. The tape yeah. removes all doubt that there was a coordinated campaign to interfere in an ongoing criminal prosecution of SNC-Lavalin and that the Prime Minister himself was orchestrating it. In light of this damning new evidence, will the Prime Minister just finally end the cover-up and start telling the truth? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, to ensure that Canadians can hear the truth, that's exactly why Justice Committee members had their meetings in public. That's exactly why the Prime Minister waived solicitor client privilege as well as Cabinet confidence. Mr. Speaker, it's also important to note that the Prime Minister, as well as the Clerk of the Privy Council in that same recording, confirmed that this was a decision for the former Attorney General to take. They confirmed within that same recording that those were tools that were only available to the Attorney General. What we know is that the former Attorney General took a decision, and that decision remains the case today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order, I'd ask the Honourable Opposition House Leader and others not to be speaking when someone else has the floor. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Mr. Speaker, you can tell a lot about a man by what he thinks is funny. Witness the Prime Minister using grassy narrows to be the butt of his jokes for his rich friends at the Laurier Club. Mercury poisoning is a nightmare. I have seen the effects of Minamata disease on children in grassy narrows. And yet grassy narrow survivors had to pay top dollar to the Liberal Party to even get close to getting to the Prime Minister. And he thinks this is funny? Does he understand that he has shown a fundamental lack of moral compassion and leadership? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, our government is steadfast in our commitment to build a new health facility in Grassy Narrows. We continue to work with the community to support their needs, and the Minister is looking forward to meeting Chief Turtle to determine how we can continue to move forward on this important issue. It is imperative we all work together, the Government of Canada, uh, the Province of Ontario, and the community, to ensure that the people of Grassy Narrows get the supports they need. Oh. For, for Timmins, James Bay. Well, he deserved better than Chief cheap laughs from the Prime Minister, the frat boy, because he promised the people of Grassy and Arrows that he would clean up that river, and he broke that promise, but he keeps his promises to his friends at the Laurier Club, which is why he sent Michael Wernick in to push 17 times in 17 minutes to get the Attorney General to overturn the SNC investigation. Thank you for your donation to the Liberal Party, even if it is an illegal donation. What happened to his promise? of ethical and moral government. The Honourable Parliament, the Secretary of the Minister of Indigenous Services. Mr. Speaker, I am very proud of, of the work that we've done as a government. Since being elected in 2015, we have found $17 billion of new dollars to invest in education, in the environment, in infrastructure. Here, here. We, have, we have removed 81 long-term water drinking advisories. Yes. Mr. Speaker, that party over there committed to balancing the budget at all costs. Thank God that Canadians thought different and elected us. The Honourable Member. The Honourable Member for Beauport Limoilou. Order. The Honourable Member for for Beauport Limoilou. Mr. Speaker, last week, confidential information with regard to a Supreme Court appointment was reported in the media. Let's be clear, the objective of this media link was to lead Canadians to believe that there was a conflictual relationship between the PM and the AG, and this was recent. We let, everything points to the fact that this media leak came from the PM, and this was a smear campaign. He has uh, tarnished the, relation, the reputation of Glenn Joyel. Will the Minister of Justice uh, investigate this breach of privacy? The Honourable Minister for Justice. We are proud of our process, not only for the appointment of judges at the Supreme Court, but also with regard to the selection of judges. Mr. Speaker, we're going to make sure that this will continue in the future, and we're going to appoint uh, top quality judges through a reliable and transparent process. Eastman. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, in an attempt to undermine the credibility of the former Attorney General, the Prime Minister attacked the sitting Chief Justice of Manitoba. The former Attorney General didn't just pull his name out of a hat, it came from a list recommended by an independent panel. The Prime Minister doesn't respect the independence of our justice system, the confidentiality of the court appointment process, or whose reputation he drags through the mud. The Justice Minister has said this leak was inappropriate. Will there be an investigation into who from the Prime Minister's office did this leak? Minister of Justice. Speaker, we're proud of our judicial appointments process, both for superior courts across the country and for the Supreme Court of Canada. And Mr. Speaker, one of the reasons why we had to fix it was precisely because Prime Minister Harper at the time rendered, rendered the in, actually went, was in conflict with the Chief Justice of Canada at the time. Mr. Speaker, we have done better. We have a, we have a process that is full of integrity, and we're going to continue forward in that direction. Order. I'm having trouble hearing the answers we need to hear. The questions and the answers. Order. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake Eastman. Mr. Speaker, the Justice Minister just besmirched the appointment process for all justices. It's shocking that the Prime Minister thinks that he's above the law, whether it's pressuring his own Attorney General to influence the independent prosecutor or leaking details to damage the reputation of a sitting judge. This Prime Minister's government is corrupt. Canada's legal community, the OECD and Transparency International have serious concerns about the Prime Minister's scandals. Will the Liberals launch an investigation into this leak? Yes or no? Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as I've stated on numerous occasions, we have confidence in our institutions, and that's why we know that committees can do their work. When it comes to one of the matters that the member has referenced, the conflict of interest and in ethics commissioner is investigating this matter. We know that there's an ongoing court case. The former Attorney General, in her appearance at committee, confirmed that the rule of law in Canada is intact and that the law was followed at all times. We recognize that we can always strengthen and improve our institutions, and that's why this government has taken measures to ensure that we continue working hard, raising the bar, so that we deliver for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Niagara Falls. Order. Mr. Speaker, I don't know why this is always so difficult uh, for the Liberals here. Last week, the Manitoba Bar Association issued a very scathing statement regarding the confidentiality of the judicial selection process by the compromisation of Chief Justice Joyelle's recommendation. Now, this serious breach of confidentiality under the Liberals has violated that Justice's privacy and undermines Canadians' confidence in our judicial yep. process. So, Mr. Speaker, why is it so difficult? for him to do the right thing, contact the privacy commissioner and get a, an investigation of this. That's what should be done. It shouldn't be that difficult. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Speaker, we have put into place a judicial appointment process across Canada for both the Supreme Court as well as for Superior Court justices. That is unparalleled, Mr. Speaker, in its rigour, its transparency, and in its outcomes. We've appointed outstanding judges, over 260 since we took office, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to do that. Member for Windsor Tecumseh. Mr. Speaker, families in Windsor will pay the price because Liberals again refuse to fight for them. Fiat Chrysler will eliminate the third shift at the Windsor Assembly Plant. That's 1,500 jobs plus the suppliers. Uh, this Prime Minister has done nothing to implement a national auto strategy. In every opportunity he had to save the manufacturing sector, he chose to abandon it. When will this Prime Minister finally stand up for Canadian workers and implement a national automotive manufacturing strategy and protect jobs. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. We're very disappointed to hear about the news in Windsor. We know how difficult the FCA third shift shutdown was for the workers and their families. That's why I immediately visited the leadership of FCA in Windsor, along with the Unifor leadership, to talk about what we can do to protect these jobs. Our government has been very clear about supporting the automotive sector. We've invested in 40 different projects that's helped leverage $6 billion worth of investments since 2015, and we'll continue to support the automotive sector. 
Mr. Speaker. Honorable member for Windsor West. Well, Mr. Speaker, Chrysler is investing $4.5 billion in Detroit, creating 6,000 jobs. GM is investing in Michigan, creating thousands of jobs. Meanwhile, GM Oshawa is closing, losing thousands of jobs. Windsor is losing jobs in the thousands. Brampton, hundreds of jobs. These automakers are investing in the future, just not here in Canada. The minister left $800 million in a fund from last year's budget, while opportunity escaped and others beat him to a new, cleaner, greener auto jobs plan. Will the minister finally turn around a losing record and make sure that the Windsor Assembly plan has a new product? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, minister of Innovation. Fundamentally disagree with the member opposite. If you look at the track record of the previous Conservative government under Stephen Harper, they lost 30,000 jobs in the automotive sector before the recession. In the first three years of our government, 6,000 new jobs were created in the automotive sector. More importantly, we have put forward a fund of $2 billion, the Strategic Innovation Fund, that's been used by the automotive sector. That's helped leverage $6 billion worth of investments here in Canada, Mr. Speaker. We always have and always will defend the automotive sector and the auto workers. Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, tax evasion remains a concern for Canadians, and that's why our government has invested over a billion dollars in the Canada Revenue Agency to equip it with the tools it needs to fight tax cheats. On April 3rd, it'll be three years since the earliest reports broke on the Panama Papers. The Minister of National Revenue has previously informed us that CRA identified 894 Canadians through this leak of information. Can the Minister update us on any progress in CRA's investigation of these Canadians? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my Honourable colleague from Thérèse de Blainville for his excellent question and his interest in the matter of tax evasion. Our government has indeed invested over a billion dollars in the Canada Revenue Agency to ensure it has the necessary tools to fight tax cheats. I'm pleased to announce that last week, CRA executed two search warrants in relation to a tax evasion case where there was an alleged attempt to evade $77 million in taxes. Our plan is working and we're starting to see results. Tax cheats can no longer hide, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Beauport-Limoilou, Charlevoix. On Friday, more evidence was released from the former Attorney General, clearly demonstrating that the Prime Minister conducted a campaign of political interference in the criminal prosecution of SNC-Lavalin. We still have a lot of questions, Mr. Speaker. In October... The Prime Minister's advisor, Mathieu Bouchard, said, quote, We can have the best policy in the world, but we need to get re-elected. What did he mean? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we know that Canadians have to learn the truth, and that's precisely why the Prime Minister waived cabinet confidence and solicitor-client privilege so that the witness could appear before the committee. For six weeks, there were meetings at which Canadians had the opportunity to hear for themselves. But what is clear is that the Conservatives made a decision before the Justice hey, Committee decided to, the chat. to discuss this case, and they don't want to hear the truth. It's up to them, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It seems like we're hearing new and new truth coming every day, which would warrant the Justice Committee to investigate further. Liberals are saying that there is nothing new on this SNC scandal. But last week, we had heard substantial new evidence from the former Attorney General. And Gerald Butts has also tabled new evidence with the committee. Clearly, the Justice Committee's investigation was not complete. Canadians still want answers. To questions like, what did the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff mean when she said she doesn't want to debate legalities anymore? Here, 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 here. Honourable Government House Leader. It's important that Canadians be able to hear from themselves, and that's exactly why, once again, the Prime Minister waived 
solicitor client privilege, as well as cabinet confidence. Mr. Speaker, this is an unprecedented action that took place because the Prime Minister recognizes that it's important for Canadians to be able to hear for themselves. These committee meetings took place in public and Canadians were able to hear. Members of the committee asked for additional documents to be submitted and those documents have now been submitted that once again confirms that the system is working and Canadians can have confidence in the system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's staff said, quote, it's just a bit ironic that she wants an alternative justice process to be available in one sense, but not for SNC. It seems like this entire Liberal government has been seized with getting bribery charges dropped against SNC. And just a little reminder, that included $30,000 for Gaddafi's son for prostitutes in Canada. So the finance... Minister believes that this company should get a special deal. Simple question, will they let him come to Justice Committee and explain to Canadians why? We know that the Justice Committee studied this matter over five weeks, which is longer than most pieces of legislation is even studied at committee. We know that the conflict of interest and ethics commissioner is currently investigating this matter. We know that there's an ongoing court case. And we know that when it comes to deferred prosecution agreements, this is a new tool that went through the House of Commons, was voted on, and it is a legal measure that can be considered. What's interesting is that we hear this sanctimony coming from the other side. But where was that member of the Conservative Party when they voted against against uh, uh, measures for women and gender programs, when they voted against programs for seniors, when they voted against national... Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals continue to spin, 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 and the truth just keeps on putting them down. We heard more shocking evidence from the former Attorney General that affirmed her testimony that the Prime Minister desperately tried to discredit. The Liberals are saying there's nothing new on the SNC-Lavalin scandal, but Jerry Butts sent new evidence to the Justice Committee to attack the former Attorney General's mm. credibility yet again. There are plenty of unanswered questions, and Canadians deserve answers. Yep. So here's a simple one for the Prime Minister. When will the Prime Minister end the cover-up? The Honourable Government House Leader. Let's try this again, Mr. Speaker, and I'll try to keep it very simple. Members that sit on the Justice Committee, there are members from all parties that are recognized in the House that sit on the Justice Committee. They came together and they set parameters when it comes to the allegations that are currently being challenged or attacked by the opposition member. Then, justice committees were able to ask witnesses to appear. Witnesses appeared, and to ensure that Canadians could hear the truth, the Prime Minister waived solicitor-client privilege, as well as cabinet confidence, for the entire time for which the allegations were being challenged. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon West. Here, the Canadian canola sector, which employs over 250,000 Canadians and contributes $26.7 billion to the Canadian economy, is under attack, having gotten wrapped up in the Liberal government's dispute with China. Last week, the Agriculture Committee convened an emergency meeting to address this crisis. Shamefully, the Liberals blocked the ministers from being questioned. Our Canadian farmers deserve answers. What assurances can the minister provide farmers that Liberals are resolving this crisis for Canada's most valuable agricultural commodity? Here, here. Here, here. Agriculture. Is that, Mr. Speaker? I really understand the worries of our farmers. I was in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba last week and the week before to speak with farmers, to speak with the stakeholders, and I can assure you that it is a very high priority for our government. The uh, CFI, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, is having dis discussions with their counterparts in China, and we are working on finding a science-based solution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for berthier masquinonge Mr. Speaker, last week the Liberals prevented the Agriculture Committee from calling ministers to appear on the canola crisis. Canola contributes $26.7 billion to the Canadian economy and employs some 250,000 Canadians all across the country. Our canola producers shouldn't have to bear the brunt of liberal mismanagement of this dispute with China. They're entitled to know what steps are being taken to address the situation. 
Since the liberals don't want the ministers appearing before the committee, what is the government's plan of attack to address this crisis? The Honorable Minister, the canola crisis and the discussions with China are things that our government is taking very seriously. I've met with farmers and our provincial counterparts and the CFIA. They're doing their work with their counterparts in China. And tomorrow afternoon with the Minister of International Trade and Diversification, we're going to appear before the committee. For Carlton. Prime Minister said on February 15th, if anyone including the former attorney, attorney General, had issues with anything they might have experienced in this government. It was her responsibility to come forward. It was their responsibility to come forward. And no one did. Now we have audio recordings where she, in fact, did come forward and said seven times in 17 minutes that his interference was inappropriate. Does the Prime Minister really expect us to believe he didn't know about that conversation? Honourable yeah. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, it's important to note that the Prime Minister has taken responsibility for the breakdown of communication and trust within his office. He has put measures in place because we always believe that we can strengthen our institutions and the way we work on behalf of Canadians. It's also been stated that the Prime Minister was not briefed by the clerk on his conversation with the former... Attorney General, Minister of Justice, and the Prime Minister also stated that he should have spoken directly with the former Minister about this matter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. The Honourable Member for Carleton. The only problem with that story is that the Clerk of the Privy Council said to uh, the former Attorney General at the time that he would be reporting back to her the substance, uh, to the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. the substance yeah. of the conversation they were having. And in that conversation, she warned the clerk yeah. no less than seven times that the actions of the Prime Minister and the clerk were totally inappropriate. Now the Prime Minister expects us to believe he didn't know a thing about that. How is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. Honourable Government House Leader. Canadians would be able to hear for themselves, the Prime Minister actually waived solicitor client privilege as well as cabinet confidence. The Prime Minister also made sure that it was encouraged that members of the Justice Committee ask witnesses to appear so that Canadians could judge and hear for themselves. I know that the members opposite cannot fathom that members of a committee could do the work on their own because they're so used to being instructed by their leader, but that's not the approach that we take on this side. We think it's important that we respect our institutions, including committees. And ethics commissioner. Well done. Order. The honourable member for Carleton. The prime minister sent out the clerk to claim that he never told the prime minister about this spectacular telephone conversation that we've now heard through audio recordings. And the clerk claims that's because the prime minister went on vacation the very next day. Well, we now know that wasn't true. He didn't leave for vacation for two more days, and the clerk has testified that the Prime Minister, notwithstanding vacations, is always available 24-7. Now, is the Prime Minister really going to expect us to believe that he would not have known about this explosive conversation? The Honourable Government House Leader chooses to pick and choose the points and say what he wants to say and listen to what he wants to hear. Mr. Speaker, we know that Canadians are paying attention and Canadians should be able to hear the truth for themselves. And that's exactly why the Prime Minister waived solicitor client privilege as well as cabinet confidence so that the former Attorney General could appear at committee. Members of the Justice Committee asked for additional documents to be presented and those documents have now been presented. Within that same audio recording, the clerk also confirmed that the Prime Minister said that these were tools and decisions for the former Attorney General to take. The former Attorney General took the decision and it remains a decision. Honorable Member, order for Toronto, Danforth. Mr. Speaker, Climate change is real and the cost of inaction is enormous. It is disappointing that while climate change is having a real impact on the health and well-being of Canadians, the Conservatives still don't have a plan to protect our environment. If you don't have a plan on climate change, you don't have a plan for the economy or for the future. Can the Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of the Environment please advise this House what actions our government is taking to fight climate change? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
for question and for her continued advocacy to protect our environment. As of today, it is no longer free to pollute in Canada. Mr. Speaker, the great news is that in her province, 8 out of 10 families will actually be better off as a result of the climate action incentive that they will claim on their taxes each year. The fact is that during the next federal election, Canadians are going to have a choice between a government that takes climate change seriously or conservative politicians like the leader of the opposition or Doug Ford who would bury their head in the sands. It may be April Fool's Day, but the biggest joke on the Hill is their climate plan. The Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, Shh. Prime Minister told Canadians to listen to Michael Wernick, and we did. And last week we heard new evidence that further proves that the Prime Minister directed a coordinated campaign to stop the criminal prosecution of SNC-Lavalin, exactly. thereby interfering with the prosecutorial discretion of the former Attorney General. So, why, when will the Prime Minister stop changing his story and start telling the truth? Yeah. Honourable Government House Leader. Stated at committee that the rule of law in Canada is intact, that Canadians uh, can have confidence in their institutions, and that the rule of law was followed. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister recognizes that we can always improve and strengthen our institutions, and that's why he acknowledged that there was a breakdown of communication and trust within his office, and he's put measures in place to ensure moving forward we have even stronger systems in place. And the Prime Minister also acknowledged that he should have spoken directly with the former minister to, on this matter, and I think that's important to note is that the Conservatives are picking and choosing, but we should look at all the facts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nejet, Timiskwatale, Basque. Over 22 million Yemenis are in extreme distress due to a four-year-long conflict. The Liberals announced $46.7 million in aid to Yemen in February. But Canada also authorized $15 billion worth of light-armoured vehicle exports to Saudi Arabia in 2016, in addition to weapon sales of over $500 million. Those arms are being used to blockade Yemeni ports, preventing humanitarian aid from getting through. Mr. Speaker, what's the point in giving humanitarian aid with one hand and preventing it from reaching civilians with the other? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for Consular Affairs. He supports the peace talks in Yemen. We call on parties to fully implement their commitments and to bring peace to the people of Yemen. We call for full access to humanitarian aid. This, we have announced additional millions to go directly towards saving people's lives in Yemen, as was referred to. Our government has also yet a UN motion mandating the UN Human Rights Commissioner to send investigators to Yemen to investigate crimes against humanity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bravo. Honourable Member for Miramichi, Grand Lake. Canada are experiencing, experiencing an infrastructure deficit after 10 years of neglect by the Harper Conservatives. For, far, for small communities, support from higher level of government is absolutely essential to getting crucial infrastructure built. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Economic Development inform the House of the recent steps our government has taken to help rural communities address infrastructure shortcomings? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my honorable colleague for his question. Rural municipalities are eager to get infrastructure projects done. And we're, we know how important it is for them to have a dependable cooperative partner in the federal government. Absolutely. That's why in Budget 2019, we introduced a top-up of $2.2 billion, which will flow directly to municipal governments to get their infrastructure projects here, 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 underway. Here, here. While Conservatives across the country continue to show disrespect for municipalities, our government remains a dependable partner for rural communities. Thank you. The the Honourable Member for Barry Innisfil. After hearing the tape last Friday, uh, Canadians were able to get a clear picture of just how far the Prime Minister and his operatives were willing to go to stop the criminal proceedings of SNC-Lavalin. In fact, he, he being the Prime Minister, was quite determined on this, Michael Wernick said on the tape, to the former Attorney General. The Prime Minister has changed his story several times and we've reached the point where he needs to speak the truth to real power. The real power being the people of Canada. When will the Prime Minister come clean and finally tell Canadians the truth? Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, Canadians 
deserve to get to hear the truth, and that's exactly why the Justice Committee was meeting in public, Mr. Speaker. And that's exactly why the Prime Minister waived solicitor-client privilege as well as cabinet confidence for the period in which the uh, Justice Committee determined parameters for them to be able to study this matter. These meetings took place in public, Mr. Speaker, so that Canadians could judge for themselves. The Conservatives will continue to speculate and pick and choose points, but we have confidence that Canadians are able to see all of the facts because they are all on the table, they are all in public. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. At last, Mr. Speaker, at last, the Quebec government is paving the way to secular government. Because in Quebec, we believe the best way to protect all religions is for the government to have none. But the secularism bill came under attack by the Prime Minister before it could even be introduced. Will the Prime Minister promise to respect Quebec's intentions and not challenge Bill 21 in court? The Honourable Justice Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government has always defended the fundamental rights of all Canadians. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects the rights of all Canadians. You cannot pick and choose what you're going to protect and what you're not going to protect. Our position is clear, Mr. Speaker. It is not for government to dictate to people what they may or may not wear or believe. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. When I hear that, I understand that this government is not at all interested in Quebec. Otherwise, they would know that secularism has been on the agenda since the Quiet Revolution. To this government, the bill on secular government is discriminatory. The Prime Minister said it's unthinkable that a free society would legitimize discrimination against anyone on the basis of religion. But it's the opposite. This bill is anti-discriminatory because it's one set of rules for all. Will the Prime Minister undertake to refrain from challenging Bill 21 in court? The Honourable Minister of Justice, Mr. Speaker, Canada is a secular country. And that's reflected in all our institutions. Government officials have the right to display their beliefs, and no one should have to choose between their religious beliefs and employment. It's everyone's responsibility to protect fundamental rights. Any attempt to erode those rights is unacceptable. Canada is open, inclusive, and diverse. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Mr. Speaker, can, uh, I really don't understand that answer. The Prime Minister has made his bed and has already put the government of Quebec on notice. And I quote again, he said, People know full well that I will defend the Charter. Mr. Legault and all Quebecers know I take a firm stand on that. Is that some kind of threat? Will the federal government respect Quebec's intentions and refrain from undertaking or funding a court challenge to Bill 21? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, the government of Quebec has just tabled this legislation. We will take our time before commenting on the bill, but as I said, we are the party of the Charter. We will always stand up for the Charter, and it is not for government to determine whether someone has to make a choice between employment and displaying their religious belief. I'd like to point out to members that a former member of the House of Commons, a former federal minister, and former occupant of the chair, and former premier of Quebec, the Honourable Jean Charest, is present in the gallery. gang so there we go i found that to be when i found it see the funny thing about it is i found it on an australian website they were showing our politics to their people because that's how screwed up they were so i thought it would be a fun example and the last piece that we're going to do um here today is one of my older pieces i don't 
again, we, we've just done a couple of hours here and we, we've got another hour to do. I think it's pretty fun. Like, again, it's a slow week in politics. I looked on CPAC. There was nothing that I thought would be more interesting. We did those pieces in the beginning to show, like, learn some things and see some perspectives. But now we're jumping into this one. And this is just me. Yeah, we'll jump right into it because it started off today with a pretty big announcement. And so we'll jump right in and, and take a peek. Have your attention, order. It's with a heavy heart that I rise to inform members of my resignation. This is as pretty Speaker big of the news. House of Commons. Big news. It has been my greatest honor as a parliamentarian to have been elected by you, my peers, to serve as the Speaker of the House of Commons for the 43rd and 44th Parliament. I have acted as your humble servant of this House, carrying out the important responsibilities of this position to the very best of my abilities. I would like to thank you. Just taking it like a champ, I guess. For your support and for your collegiality during my term as Speaker. This House is above any of us. Therefore, I must step down as I'm your zooming Speaker. in. I reiterate my profound regret for my error in recognizing an individual in the House during the joint address to Parliament of President Zelensky. That public recognition has caused pain to individuals and communities, including the Jewish community in Canada and around the world, in addition to survivors of Nazi atrocities in Poland, among other nations. Seems like a sincere apology. I, I don't I know what you'd say. Responsibility for my actions. My resignation is effective at the end of the sitting day tomorrow, Wednesday, September 27th, to allow preparations for the election of a new speaker. Until that time, the deputy speakers will chair the house proceedings. Thank you. Merci. Substitute teacher. Substitute teacher's coming in. Look, here he goes. So yeah, that's uh, some pretty, pretty big news on Parliament Hill. Um, I think I said Capitol Hill earlier. I've watched a lot of American politics, not a lot of Canadian politics. Um, anyway, my mistake. So yeah. Uh, and now I guess we'll, we'll jump right into question period. Um, and yeah, we'll, 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 we'll jump so on question period. Well, so I just want to make sure, uh, the head, uh, audio, uh, gets pulled up. So Chris Dodgema is our new, or right, is the speaker of the house today. The leader of the official opposition. Hmm. Here, Polyev gets big applause every time. Seems really popular. The Liberal President Speaker resigned after the massive shame and embarrassment of having recognized a Nazi in the House of Commons. Our international reputation, though, is in the Prime Minister's hands. Diplomatic and intelligence services could have vetted the list of guests. And in fact, that vetting is the Prime Minister's responsibility. Today, the Prime Minister needs to take responsibility in order to reverse the massive damage done to our international reputation. Will he rise in this place and apologize for this massive and it, shameful It would failure? seem that uh, the Conservatives are not uh, the Honourable House satisfied. Leader with Thank you, Mr. just the Speaker stepping down. They First, want an apology at least it is important from the Prime Minister's to office. To highlight that the Speaker of the House of Commons is independent and elected by all members of this House. I thank the Speaker for taking responsibility for his actions. Thank you as for taking this one for the and team. As he repeated just a few moments ago, it was his decision he accepts responsibility for it, and I think that was the honorable and the right thing to do. The honorable opposition leader. Yes, but the Prime Minister's intelligence and protocol services had the right to ask for lists of all those who would be recognized. What's more, the responsibility to defend Canada's reputation, that is the Prime Minister's responsibility. We are currently 
experiencing the worst blow to our reputation in all of our history. So where's the Prime Minister? Where's he hiding? Why won't he rise in the House of Commons to defend Canadians' reputation? Go get him, Peter. Go get him. Stick it to him. Ask those questions that you never get answers to. Remind the Keep asking. members uh, whether we can, uh, we, we cannot say whether someone is here or not in the chamber. You're a substitute teacher. Easy. On that line, just kidding. Closely. Substitute teacher. Just kidding. Uh, House leader for the for the for government. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The opposition leader knows full well. The Speaker of the House resigned today. He accepted responsibility for the decision that he made on his own. He alone decided to invite and recognize that individual. As all members of this House know full well, it was shameful for us as members. It was shameful for Canadians. He took responsibility, and that was the honorable decision. They are just speaker, trying to stick it to poor old speaker Tony, man. Taken the fall yeah, the this exactly. We were saying this yesterday. International shame and embarrassment. But the Prime Minister's protocol and intelligence units had the right to ask for the list of all those who would be present and recognized around a war leader from a country that is trying to defend its freedom from not only an invasion, but a propaganda war. The Prime Minister did not carry out that responsibility, and now our nation's reputation is in tatters. Will he stand up and apologize to Canadians, to the Jewish community, to the Ukrainian people, and to the entire world for this mess that he helped create? Well, Peter wants him to apologize to everybody. The Honourable Government Everyone. Leader. Or old Petrina. I, I feel that I have to remind the Leader of the Opposition this, although he knows it very well himself, that the Speaker of the House of Commons is independent. Where is Trudeau? ...upon by all of the members of Parliament, and he is the Speaker of all parliamentarians. Mr. Speaker, uh, we know, and the Leader opposite knows, that this was the decision solely of the Speaker of the House of Commons. He chose to invite this individual. He chose to recognize him without without informing the government or the Ukrainian delegation. Poor He's Tony, going down all by himself. Accept his resignation, and I'm glad that he did it. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Minister yeah. says he's not responsible for our diploma diplomatic reputation, even though that is precisely the job of the head of government. Like when he says he's not responsible for the inflationary spending that led prices and interest rates to rise faster than at any time in history. He's not responsible for housing costs doubling after he promised to lower them. He's not responsible for dressing up in racist costumes so many times he can't remember Peter. it's all Canadians yep. that needed to learn a lesson from his personal conduct. And now he says he's not responsible to vet the very people that come into contact with a visiting head of state. Is it that he's not responsible or that he's irresponsible? Yeah. The Honourable Government House Leader. He asks the right questions. I would posit the wrong that person the answering. opposition is being very irresponsible right now in his accusations when in fact he knows the truth and it's why every party in this House has asked for the resignation which has now been received by the Speaker of the House because it was his decision and his decision alone to invite this individual and to recognize him in this chamber. The Leader of the Opposition knows this. He is irresponsibly politicizing this issue. Issue. This is something that has brought shame and embarrassment to all of Parliament and indeed all of Canadians. And the Speaker did the honourable thing in resigning. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, I am responsible enough to show up for work, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Nah, oh, whoa, good one. Go well, get him, PP. Go well, get him. Has there ever been a greater diplomatic embarrassment in the history of our country? I mean, literally, in coffee shops and gyms and businesses and boardrooms around the world, people are reading about this massive and shameful disgrace that unfolded under the watch of a Liberal Speaker Shame. and a Liberal Prime Minister. And yet, he can't even show up for work. Where is he and why is he hiding under a rock today? 
everybody has a bad day, you kind of still have to go to work. Like, Justin's just hiding. He's just hiding. He's, where has he been? Get him under control, Chris. Yeah. I'm just going to stand here for a few minutes. I'm just a temporary guy. I'm just going to stand here. Come on, look at him. This is this. All right, well. Are you ready? Okay. Oh. Sarcasm. Someone is here or not is a, not allowed by the rules of this house. The Honorable Government House Leader, if if she wants to answer it, I'll give her the option. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. This is precisely why the Speaker of the House announced his resignation because he took responsibility for his actions that have hurt parliamentarians and have hurt all Canadians and indeed Canada's reputation. That is why How long do you think it's going to take for her for to start bringing up but her uh, ironic, Mr. Jewish Speaker, roots? Guaranteed she will. Heard a word of support for Ukraine from the leader of the opposition until It's what I would do if I was desperate. So I, I said she's desperate. She's going to have to lean on her Jewish heritage. At some point, you got to get garner sympathy somehow. Pretty exciting day. day. Looks like. Looks like. Out of control, Chris. Get him under control, Speaker. Did he just do a horse like? The honourable member for Belleuil Chambly. He did. Mr. Speaker. A question more about substance than style. What's up, Eves? The official opposition leader and I agree on something. He's dressed sharp. Which is significant. The Prime Minister is not responsible for the mistake, but he is responsible for fixing it. He is head of state. It's his responsibility. So, does the Prime Minister intend to officially apologize on behalf of Canada and unfortunately still on behalf of Quebec? Does he intend to apologize to all those who suffered as a result of the dramatic well and serious dressed, event nice which can, took place in this place? Great tie. The Honourable Government House Leader. And her again, you, God. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague for his question. Talk about your family. The grandfather or something. already apologized for the decision that he made. It was a shameful decision for all of us as members and for all Canadians. All of us, but just... It's important that he take Anthony responsibility Rotter. for his actions and Everybody decisions. But Everybody but Anthony Rotter. in this House called for his resignation. He did so, and that was the honourable choice. Was the, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Such the honour and Jean dishonour. After six questions, it's hard to believe that the government house leader hasn't yet understood that the responsibility of the prime minister and the responsibility of the house are not one and the same. The prime minister needs to assume his responsibilities as head of state, as a head of government. So he needs to apologize to the Jewish community in Quebec, in Canada, and around the world. He needs to apologize to all parliamentarians and to all Canadians. And he must specifically apologize to President Zelensky because this event made him target of Russian propaganda. The Honorable Government House Leader. Making Thank those you, Mr. Speaker. Russian propagandists As I said yesterday, work overtime. I am a Canadian of Jewish origin. Here it is. Here it is. Okay, it was a matter of time. A Holocaust survivor. This incident hurt me go, personally, girl. as it hurt all members of this house and all Canadians. The incident also hurt President Zelensky. The Speaker of the House apologized and took responsibility for his decision, which was shameful and painful for us all. He did the responsible thing by resigning. Thank There's you, not Mr. much Speaker. more shameful than what you're doing. 
Yesterday, it was manufacturers' oh, turn great. to be summoned by the innovation this minister. Clown. I used to like this guy a lot. That they have jacked up Not prices anymore. because he's only asking them Cow. to stabilize prices. After the meeting, the minister said that inaction is not an option, except that that is exactly what he's been doing for the past two years. Will the minister make a commitment to Canadian families? Will he commit to them that their Thanksgiving meal will cost less this year than it did last year? The Honourable Innovation Minister. For real, though, nobody sports a Mr. turban Speaker, better than him. I thank my colleague for the question. I'm happy to hear Innovation, that science, and industry. also has read that we've said that inaction is not an option. Nerd. That is why we summoned major grocers in Canada to ask them to stabilize prices in Canada. And I expressed to them the frustration of 40 million Canadians. I told them that the number one issue that matters to Canadians is the cost of living, affordability, and grocery prices. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we tabled Bill C-56, which will address competition because we want more competition in Canada. And I hope the colleague will support that bill so that we can move forward. Liberal inaction is too costly. We have in Halifax a very serious situation. People currently living in a campground fear they'll be homeless when it closes for the season because there's simply nowhere else for them to go. These people have worked hard, they've got jobs, some live in the campground, some work there, but there's simply no other housing for them to rent in the surrounding area. They don't have months to wait for the government to approve new housing. They'll be homeless in weeks. This is the result of a prime minister who could have and should have built more affordable housing, but didn't. What will the prime minister tell them when they're homeless in a few weeks? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Homeless isn't a problem. Oh, Charlie Slick, here we go. Continue to invest in affordable housing, Mr. Hanson, Sean Fraser, province of Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. Point out to the honourable member right now, as we speak. The City Council in Halifax is actually debating a motion to change the way that they permit homes to be built as a result of the Housing Accelerator Fund that's going to yield more homes for people Nobody, who live in the city this of guy is the, the In addition well, to changing the way cities build it. homes, we're putting incentives on the table to get more homes built, and we're going to work with jurisdictions that have local authority to figure out how we can continue to increase the affordable housing stock as we have been for the last number of years. I'm going to be pleased to work with my honorable colleague to advance solutions for some of the most vulnerable people in Canada. Both well, Charlie for Slick. Hill. The Speaker of the House took the fall and the Prime Minister continues to blame everyone right. else. A full-blown international embarrassment for our country, for our allies and for everything this nation did to defeat the Nazis. This An jacket. actual Nazi invited to the House of Commons, welcomed and celebrated as a hero and a government that vetted everyone here. Shame. The PM has called oh, Canadian citizens up. Nazis. Will he and muster they're, they're the courage and stand so. up on his feet today and take it's responsibility? The Honourable Government House Leader. Complain about a sore back now. Go for more sympathy. On Friday. Had anyone in this house known what the speaker was going to do ahead of time and who this person I was, I am certain that not a single she person has a cute bracelet, would though. have stood in this House of Commons. But the fact of the matter is, and my Conservative colleagues know this, that neither the Prime Minister, nor the government, nor the Ukrainian delegation, or any parliamentarian in this place knew ahead of time. It was the Speaker's decision. He's taken responsibility, and he has resigned. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Thornhill. Speaker, the minister okay. who is now whispering was louder when she also wound, painted go, Canadians go as Nazis. Get upset. And she can't bring herself to apologize for an actual Nazi this government vetted. Worse even, she tried to strike it from the historical record of this house as if it never happened. A descendant of Holocaust survivors distorting the Holocaust. You should be ashamed of yourself. Oh, you don't know. It's How pretty harsh. Know. It's pretty harsh for old question period. Oh, and they're standing up. I don't know. that. Yeah, yeah that's true, though. It's true. It's a good argument.
Blame it on Anthony Rota. Questions and comments to be through the chair. The Honourable Member for Thornhill, you've got about five seconds left there. How many times I'm going to have to ask this Prime Minister for an apology that he is he has slandered, dishonoured and embarrassed Holocaust survivors, but I think two times is too, too many. Yeah. What an interesting haircut she has. The member opposite tries to personally attack me. I will actually stay focused on the facts. I don't know what she's saying, but it doesn't sound pleasant. And she knows this as well as every other member in this house is that it was the speaker who decided to invite this individual. It was the speaker who acknowledged that he was going, who was going to acknowledge him in the chamber. No one in this chamber knew ahead of time of who he was. The speaker has taken full responsibility for this. He has resigned. It was the right thing to do. It was the honorable thing to do. And it is something that had to be done. They only gave her one line. They should have given her more lines to deliver. Like, instead of just like, it was his fault, he said he did it, so he apologized, he resigned, and that's it. That's all they gave her. Global Affairs, the Privy Council, what did the you Diplomatic got? Protocol Office, Parliamentary Services, and the RCMP. What do they all have in common? They all have massive resources for vetting visitors to this place. The Prime Minister just threw the Speaker under the bus. But the truth is, it is the true. buck stops with him. Allowing a Nazi to be honoured in this chamber has embarrassed Canada on the international stage. Shame on him for bringing shame on this chamber. Shame! Will the Prime Minister finally take responsibility, do the right thing, and apologize? He will not! He will not. Government house leader. Well, the government house leader again. They got to get a new one. I will remind my Shouldn't you resign? Because they seem to have forgotten that they also called no, them the messed up on the graphic nation this morning because they recognized that it was actually the speaker who did this on his own. Instead of trying to cast blame where no blame should be cast, the speaker has taken responsibility for his actions. He has resigned. It was the honorable thing to do. It was the right thing to do after a moment in our history on Friday that was deeply embarrassing, deeply shameful for Canadians, and that has hurt all of us as parliamentarians mm -hmm. and Canadians. Here, Thank here. You, Mr. Speaker. What's going to be fun is 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 if she comes up and minister and that member tried to bury this sordid affair with a motion to strike history from the record. For the sake of the six million Jews who perished at the hands of the Nazis, conservatives said no. Hey. This affair has resulted in a diplomatic disaster for Canada and gives the Russian government and their illegal invasion a propaganda win. When will the PM stop trying to erase history, take responsibility for once, and apologize? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Government House Leader. One of these times she's going to be asked a question that doesn't have to do with what she's speaking about and give the same answer. Thank you. Exactly. Now she's giving the shortened version of the same answer. Mr. I just said that. I'll share with you a few headlines in media around the world since Friday's event. Deeply hurtful. Go Pierre Paul Hoos. A Nazi veteran was invited to the Canadian Parliament. Scandal in Canada. Former Nazi fighter in Canadian Parliament. Canada is the laughing stock of the world, the whole world. Will the Prime Minister stand up and apologize or will he keep hiding? The Honourable Government House Leader. Every member of this House feels that the House Speaker's choice was unforgivable, unacceptable and shameful to all Canadians. That's why the House Speaker apologized, took responsibility, and resigned. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg. She Charles. has a lot of patience. There's something the government doesn't seem to understand, Mr. Speaker, and that's that they have a responsibility. In 2015, legislative amendments were made so that the Parliamentary Protective Service is tasked with vetting visitors, for example, during the visit of foreign presidents. The Prime Minister was unable to maintain Canada's diplomatic security, so can he stand up in this House 
as soon as possible to apologize. The Honourable Government House Leader. They just want an apology, Justin. As I stated yesterday. Where are you, Jay Boy? The Parliamentary Protection Service followed all security protocols. The House Speaker was the one who was responsible for this decision to invite. Do you not find it a little bit strange that Trudeau's not there? Like, we might be getting his Halloween costume ready, like it, it's getting close. Mr. Speaker, Where's a wave Trudeau? of bankruptcies awaits our small and medium enterprises if the federal government does not wake up. That's the warning that was issued on the Hill today by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. The government is giving them 18 days to obtain bank loans, but that won't save SMEs that are up to their necks in debt. They have been struggling to repay their emergency account loans for the past three years. Unfortunately, what awaits them is bankruptcy. When will the government finally open a direct channel of communication with struggling businesses in order to offer them appropriate payment deferral options? It's a good question. The Honourable Employment Minister. Everybody's broke. Everybody's broke. I thank my honourable colleague for her question. About one million biz uh, businesses were able to stay open thanks to this government's measures. We know that there has been rising inflation, and there have been supply chain issues, and also the situation of, in Ukraine. Those are all factors which have been difficult for businesses in Canada. But we will be able to support them to keep their businesses in good standing. We support people in other ways as well, Mr. Speaker. The Canada Child Benefit, the Canada Workers Benefit. We are here for Quebec's businesses, and we will continue to be there for them. The Honourable Member for Terrebonne. Mr. Speaker, our small businesses are not asking for charity. They simply want to avoid bankruptcy while paying back what they owe. The government could sign deferred payment agreements with companies that are struggling without losing any subsidies. That way, the government could avoid closures, avoid job losses, and get back what it is owed instead of losing that, all of that due to a wave of bankruptcies. When will the government finally realize that being flexible with SMEs is the only fair and responsible way out of this crisis? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let us be clear and let us look at the He facts. does dress well. We are here to support businesses. We supported them throughout the pandemic. Now we're on the other end of the pandemic and we've been very clear about what we will do to help businesses which used SEBA. We are there for them, for entrepreneurs to support them. We supported entrepreneurs and we will continue to support them. The Honourable Member for Abitibi-Témiscamingue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a rock and roller right here. Nearly two thousand SMEs in Quebec have Not surprised. declared bankruptcy in the past year, and the according block, to the Canadian huh? Federation of Independent Business, this is just the start. One in five businesses is contemplating closing in the next year. The elephant in the room, Mr. Speaker, is that sixty percent of bankruptcies in Canada are in Quebec because small business is Quebec's economic model. We're going to have to pay for our entrepreneurial spirit and our support for local entrepreneurs if the government does not show some flexibility. When will the government wake up and stop pushing our SMEs into bankruptcy? Good question. The Honourable Employment Minister. Mr. Speaker, before I was in politics, I was an entrepreneur. I know what it's like to have to pay business bills, to make sure that you have enough money to pay your employees. I have a lot of empathy for Quebec's businesses. That's why our government was very clear about its plan to help those repaying CBUT loans. Have, have you ever had to have a conversation with a very successful entrepreneur? They're obnoxious. Like, they don't realize it's a bit of a lottery. I understand hard work, all that, but there's a little bit of a... Luck a in of involved? The Nazi Waffen SS was even invited to attend an event in the House of Commons is appalling. That he was honored during the address of the Ukrainian president is an inexcusable Mark Stahl just got a fresh government. new the tight perm. SS committed numerous atrocities in Poland. Old school and members perm. of the Polish government have now demanded an apology. You don't see that style very often anymore. Embarrassment. This has become a diplomatic disaster requiring immediate action from the Prime Minister. So will he finally take responsibility, do the right thing, and apologize? And I got a perm. The Honourable Government House Leader. Speaker, as the member opposite knows full well, it was the Speaker of the House who invited this individual. Tory's got to get off it. Stop, stop. It. Like, they're, they're not going to give it. Trudeau didn't even show up. He doesn't give a shit. The government, the Prime Minister, he doesn't care. He's in Auschwitz, hanging out, just checking it out, sightseeing. Across this country, including 
Polish Canadians. And for that, the Speaker has apologized. He has resigned. That was the right thing to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chilliwack Hope. The Prime Minister and his office, who organized President Zelensky's visit down to the most minute detail, every moment of the visit was planned, and every guest in this House should have been vetted or was vetted by the Prime Minister's office. But somehow, a member of the Nazi Waffen SS was not only allowed to attend, but was celebrated on the floor of this House. The Prime Minister's office organized the entire event. The Prime Minister's office vetted the entire guest list. So so when will he finally take responsibility, come out of hiding, and apologize? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, my Conservative is opposite continues to spread false information. And again, I don't want to hear her say the same thing again, but they're asking the same question. They just, where is Trudeau? That's the funny thing. He should be answering these questions. I don't think that he, I think he knew he wasn't going to be able to take it. Um, uh, old Peter Pan had some really sassy things to say. Like he just avoided it. He called in sick. He took a sick day. Chamber knew ahead of time. Thank you. Nobody knew ahead of time. The honourable member for Mégantic-Lérable. The Liberal Prime Minister has once again embarrassed all Canadians and there is outrage around the world. His lack of judgment, his negligence or simply his incompetence are once again making the news worldwide. In fact, Le Monde, a French newspaper, reported in the midst of Zelensky's visit to Canada, there was a misguided tribute to a former soldier in a Nazi division. A headline in the Czech Republic, more fuel for the Russians' fire. In Canada, a Nazi veteran was applauded in front of Zelensky. Will the Prime Minister, for once, take responsibility and apologize for hurting Now, now he's probably going to show up and apologize. around the world. Say, oh, sorry. Whoops. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, all members of this House called for the House Speaker's resignation. We all realized that it's it so was boring. You've said this between yesterday and today. To incident on Friday, which times? was sh shameful for us as members of Parliament, shameful for us as Canadians. They should have g given you some PR or some advice in other ways to steer the conversation. Flip it back a little bit. Depoliticize this political issue. And to stick to the facts. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Megantikleirafle. In Finland, the, it was said the Canadian Parliament made an embarrassing mistake during the Ukrainian President's visit. The guest of honour has served in Nazi Germany. In the Netherlands, it says a standing ovation for a former SS office in Canada's House of Commons. Washington Post, they've said that a Nazi was honoured in Parliament. The news has circled the globe, and the Liberal Prime Minister, who invited President Zelensky to address the House, he is solely and ultimately responsible for this embarrassment and the damage it has done to the Ukrainian people and to, Can to Canada's reputation. When will the Prime Minister come out of hiding and apologize? It's a good question. <laughs> for the 25th time, the Lord. House Leader. Oh, God. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've already answered this question. The Conservatives, the Conservative members know the facts. I would invite them once again to remain on the facts and not say things that are incorrect. Thank you. Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, people are seeing okay. a rising tide of organized hate and hate-related violence. This week, a whites-only Mums and Tots poster yeah. was put up at a bus stop in I heard about community. that. That's awful. The residents of Port Moody, Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam, and Moran Belcara are outraged. They want the government to take stronger action against hate in their communities, yet the Liberals are nowhere to be found. Will the government listen to Canadians and take concrete action to combat all forms of hate, discrimination, racism and violence? I don't know if that's all the Liberals' fault, like, but good, good question. To our outrage by what we've recently learned and we take the issue of hate discrimination um, in all forms <laughs> extremely seriously hate, we're discrimination, going to continue to work racism, with local communities prejudice. on how best to take these concrete action but make no mistake Mr. Speaker we as a government feel that hate has no place in this country and we will do everything we can to ensure that communities remain safe 
The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, Danielle Smith face. and her Conservative government are threatening to take Albertans out of the Canadian pension plan. This is a page that directly comes from the leader of the Conservative Party when he said he would cut the CPP. People need to know that their futures are secure and of course we have heard nothing from the Conservative leader of, of the opposition. Canadians don't want Conservatives fired up. pensions. This isn't Smith's money. This isn't the Conservatives' money. This is Canadians' money. Will the Prime Minister do everything he can to protect Albertans and Canadians' pensions from this absurd plan? Ooh, she's pissed. The Honourable Minister Ooh. of Employment. plan. Every single Edmontonian, every single Albertan that I have spoken to on this issue, including email in my inbox this very day, Mr. Speaker, is about the government of Alberta keeping their hands off of Canadian pensions, making sure it stays under the management of Canada, Mr. Speaker. People have paid into the Canada pension plan. They wanted to be there in their retirement. We will do everything in our power to keep the pensions in the hands of Canadians and in the CBP. All right. Getting fired up here. Yeah. Getting fired up. Member for Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, this year Mark Canada's worst wildfire season on record, especially in the Northwest Territories, with three of our four largest communities and nearly seventy percent &M. of our population evacuated. So twenty-eight million dollars recently announced for the NBT by the government of Canada is very much appreciated. But along with real cost of fighting the fires, the evacuation resulted in many businesses that had to close down for weeks. Can the Minister of Northern Affairs please give an, an update on our government's plan to support businesses in the Northwest Territories as they get back up and running again after the evacuations? Good question. Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Minister question. of Northern Affairs. What's up? The member for his incredible work in helping his constituents uh, during an unprecedented wildfire season in Northwest Territories. As the member mentioned, our government uh, has been there during the worst of the fires and will continue to be there as the, con as the communities continue to bounce <laughs> back from the wildfires. As northerners know, northerners know to the right. small businesses are the backbone of Never the economy, talks. and I can guarantee the member for Northwest Territories that more support is on its way. Global Affairs, the Privy Council, the Diplomatic right. Protocol Office, the Professional RCMP, business suit. what do they all have in common? One, they have massive resources to vet visitors in this place. <laughs> Two, they all report to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is trying to shift the blame to the Liberal Speaker, but it's him and him alone that bears the responsibility of a successful state visit. The Prime Minister is in Ottawa today. today. Will he take responsibility today for his Not international today. diplomatic disaster and apologize to Canadians and our allies? <laughs> tired of these same questions, but I guess, you know, what are you going to do? I just want to make a um, quick comment that the speaker is just a speaker. We're not belonging to any party when we're in this position, so I would just, uh, I would just, I don't know about that. Um, I'd rather not call you know, out, of, out of order. So whatever Chris Donchman is talking about right there, we'll be right back to it. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for hanging out. Uh, it is fun. We have a good chat room. Right back to the show. These actions. As far as asking the same question, she asked it in one of the more interesting ways. Um, they got to stop asking this lady questions, though. The leader lost all credibility when she moved to whitewash the official record and asked all of us to pretend that this diplomatic disaster never happened. It did happen. The whole Go get it, Carrie Lane. It happened under this Prime Minister's watch, and he's refusing to take responsibility. Again, he is in Ottawa today. Will he do the honourable thing, the right thing, stand in this place and nope. apologize? Nope. The honourable government house He's getting his Halloween costume organized. Calm down, Carolyn. Speaker, the member opposite. 
transit would know that when egregious acts happen in this place, that they are sometimes struck from the record. In fact, when the member from St. Albert uh, read some very inappropriate remarks into the record, they were struck from the record. Mr. Speaker, that is something that we took seriously. The House decided not to do this. Again, had members in this House been aware of what they were doing at that time, I feel very confident no one would have stood in the pot of this individual. What she's saying right there. Uh. Mr. Speaker, it's not just the reputation of Parliament that has been sullied. It's the Michael reputation Chong. of this country on the world stage. Right. This isn't just a parliamentary issue. It's a full-blown diplomatic one. Ian Bremmer of the Eurasia Group said yesterday. This is a good point. This was the worst week for Canadian diplomacy wow. in I can't remember how long. Wow. Diplomacy is the responsibility of the government of Canada. Okay. So when will the Prime Minister take responsibility for this diplomatic disaster? It's a good one. Again, asking the same damn question. Uh, in an interesting way, but I don't think boring answer. Here we go. This House disagrees at how horrific what happened on Friday was. In fact, that's why every single member in this place called. They're getting the rowdy in the background, the speaker, and because he brought not only shame and embarrassment to this Parliament, but they're putting a lot on Anthony Rodman. Said several like, times in this House. That is why he has apologized. It is why he has resigned. And they, they, something that people don't like anyway. Forward, but we recognize the hurt that this has caused to communities across this country as well as around the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Wellington Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, the Speaker bears responsibility but so too does the Prime Minister. It was the Prime Minister in his office that made a decision on short notice to request a joint address for President Zelensky on the floor of this House. That decision came with consequences. That decision came with responsibilities, some of which we are witnessing around the world today. So again, when will the Prime Minister for once take some responsibility for this diplomatic disaster? Go Michael Chong, that's good. The same question, but hammering it home. But here comes a boring answer. Mention your grandfather again. The first and only Conservative MP that has actually acknowledged that this was the responsibility of the Speaker, which is why the Speaker took responsibility oh. and it's why he resigned. So I want to thank Not going to thread that needle, baby. That ain't going to happen. The facts, which we haven't heard from most of our nope. Conservative colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my back is so. Oh. The Honourable Member for Avignon La Métis, Matan Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, Ooh. last week during the Climate Ambition Summit, we learned of Canada's intention to double oil production in Newfoundland by 2030. Ooh. Double oil production. She's well dressed. Conservatives even applauded the government yesterday on this subject. All the politicians Hooray are so well dressed. for Canada, a major oil producing country, as the Minister of the Environment would say. Mr. Speaker, in the fight against climate change, does the Minister of the Environment think it's good news when the Conservatives applaud him? <laughs> the Honourable Minister of the Environment. It's funny. Oh, Mr. yes. Speaker. Minister of the Environment. That's what he looks like. He looks like an environment guy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can't afford a haircut. Thank my colleague for her question. Last week, Hippie. there were two pieces of good news. There are two new Canadian sites that will be added to UNESCO's World Heritage Sites. Two sites. That might not be a good news for the Bloc Québécois. One of them would have been an oil drilling site if it hadn't been for the hard work of environmentalists, Indigenous people, and the government of Quebec. So Anticosti is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Honourable Member for avignon la Matisse, Matan Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, 2023 is on track to be the hottest year on record. Hot as British hell. British Columbia, Alberta, the Northwest Territories, Nova Scotia, and Quebec have suffered forest fires on a dramatic, unprecedented scale. That's true. Biodiversity is threatened. Oceans are warming to record levels. Yet the Liberal Conservative Coalition applauds increased drilling in the Atlantic. Listening to them applaud, you'd think we didn't need to reduce our dependence on oil. We needed to increase production. What will it take for them to realize that they are playing a very dangerous game for humanity? Good question. Are we going to get the environment? the environment? Yeah, here we go. Change. I like this guy. He's all right. 
Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, if the bloc was hands. as enthusiastic about working with us to fight climate change, it, things would go even better. But Mr. Speaker, Canada is the only major oil producing country to be invited to the Climate Ambition Summit last week. Why? because we have the most ambitious goals to reduce methane emissions, because we are the only G20 country to have eliminated subsidies for fossil fuels. No other G20 country did it. We did it two years earlier than expected, and the Prime Minister said we would cap set emissions from oil and gas. We are the only country in the world, Mr. Speaker, to have made that commitment. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake, Eastman. These Liberals have embarrassed Canada, insulted the Jewish community, undermined our Ukrainian allies and disrespected our veterans. And this Prime Minister refuses to accept any responsibility. He's either willfully or ignorantly discarded his duty to protect President Zelensky from this international disaster. Because of his negligence, Liberals have helped fuel Russia's propaganda machine against Ukraine. So will the Prime Minister finally accept responsibility, stand in this House, and apologize to all Canadians and to our Ukrainian allies. Still wearing the Ukrainian tie, he's got a ribbon, his handkerchief. Oh God, turn her off. Stop and acknowledge it. this individual was the speakers and the speakers alone. For that, he has apologized. For that, he has resigned. Mr. Speaker, this is something that has brought shame and embarrassment shame. to all of us as parliamentarians. What about your grandfather? To all Canadians. It has hurt Canadian communities across this country. Jewish Canadians, Ukrainian communities, any community that was impacted by the Holocaust. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Here on Friday, Parliament stood and honoured a Nazi. It is unbelievable that this happened, and the Canadian people deserve to be represented with dignity in this House and on the world stage, and that was taken away from them. The Liberals have so profoundly failed Canadians. This Cal is beyond Danko? shameful and embarrassing, and it will never be forgotten. Now the Speaker has resigned, the Prime Minister bears responsibility. Choice. He is in charge. This happened under his watch. Mm -hmm. Will he finally do the right thing and apologize to Canadians? Ooh. Probably not. The Honourable Government House Leader. I think we all agree with my Honourable colleague that we wish this had never happened because it did bring shame and embarrassment shame. to every single shame. member of this House as well as every single Canadian. Unfortunately, it was the Speaker and the Speaker alone who chose to invite this individual and acknowledge this individual in the gallery unbeknownst to any member of parliament in here which is why every single member present stood and applauded because they were led to believe this individual was someone who he wasn't we know that that was not the case the speaker has taken responsibility and he has resigned Kildon in St. Paul. There is no more time for liberal uh, excuses, Mr. Speaker, and more deflections. Canadians deserve far Mikhail better Dan than that. Dan Friday was supposed to be a day where Canadians and Ukrainians were able to come together and stand against Putin's brutal regime and their illegal, brutal, deadly invasion of Ukraine. The president of Ukraine was in Parliament. The world's eyes were on Canada, but due to liberal negligence and incompetence, a Nazi was honoured at that time, Mr. Speaker. Canada has been profoundly embarrassed and there will be lasting international consequences. The Prime Minister cannot escape his responsibility to this House and to Canadians. The buck stops with him, Mr. Speaker. Will he be apologizing to Canada and our world allies, yes or no? The Honourable Government House Leader. Again, I would ask my honourable colleagues to please stick, stick to, the to the facts. They all know that this was the decision of the Speaker of the House of Commons to both invite this individual and recognise him without informing a single member of Parliament, the Prime Minister, the Government or the Ukrainian delegation. We all feel completely embarrassed and shamed by this fact. And for this, the speaker has not only apologized. How many times did she say okay, that answer's really the same thing. old by now? Um, however, they're getting better at asking the questions. They're getting more pissed off. But I would prefer to see some other questions today to see some other people speaking.
example in my writing what do we got of Laval an American politician no he's French shared with me must be from their Vermont. concerns about the rising cost of living in terms of food prices Bob Dole and housing costs could the Minister of Innovation Science and Industry please inform the house of the steps the government is taking to make life more affordable for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd first like to thank the member for Laval-les-Îles for his work. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we know that the people of Laval are focused on the work We've taken concrete action to help people at a time when the cost of food is the number one issue. Mr. Speaker, this morning I met with major manufacturers to tell them three things. First, to express the frustration people are feeling throughout the country, including the people of Laval, saying that the cost of groceries is the number one issue. Number two, I asked them to be a part of the solution because we all have a role to play to help Canadians during a difficult time. Mr. Speaker, I can assure people that with the member of Laval is ill, we will continue to fight. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Mr. Speaker, I was honoured to introduce the National Holocaust Monument Bill in this House, which received unanimous support from all parties. This monument Go helps Tim. Canadians learn more about the horrors of the Holocaust. But never did I imagine that in this same House of Commons, a Nazi would be invited and honoured in this place. Mr. Speaker, when will the Prime Minister stand up, take responsibility for this massive insult and apologise to Canadians? Get him, Tim. It's a good question. You know, my family walked in to Auschwitz. And only my grandfather and great uncle. Hanging on to a baby. Never in a million years would I have imagined that the Speaker of the House of Commons would invite someone who fought for the Nazis. They're dumping it on Anthony Rodman, that it's, it's a shitty way to treat him, man. Treat him, man. To treat him, man. Even, we all it just couldn't be all of his fault. It couldn't, it, like, somebody else. Broken. We are hurt by this. I personally my am grandfather. hurt by this because never in my life would I have ever done this had I known otherwise. And I assure you that no other member would have done that either. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can you rub my feet? Speaker, last Friday, as a result of this Prime Minister's inaction, a Nazi veteran Kojak. was allowed access into this chamber. Although this person was invited by the Speaker, it is the responsibility of the government to organize and ensure the security of foreign dignitaries. Further, both the Prime Minister and this individual were present in the same reception room in West Block after the speeches. There is no way this international embarrassment is solely on the Speaker. This I agree. Liberal government is responsible as well. Will the Prime Minister finally take responsibility, do the right thing, and no. apologize to Canadians? It's not going The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the allegation that my Honourable colleague made is simply false. That did not happen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. She should start just not responding. Mr. Speaker, what happened Friday is unacceptable. We gave a standing ovation Gerard Daltel is going to straighten Canada's it out now. reputation has been tarnished around the world. Believe it or not, yesterday, the government did something Gerard wants to kick a dead horse. ...by asking to erase the facts, the truth, and history. What cowardice, Mr. Speaker, to erase history is to condemn ourselves to relive it. It's typical of this cowardly government, which... I haven't seen that one yet. ...any responsibility. Nice. nice. When will the Prime Minister rise in the House and recognize that a that he made a serious mistake and apologized on behalf of all Canadians to the world. I bet you he gets pretty rowdy after a six-pack. Mr. Speaker, as my honourable colleague knows, when really horrible things happen in this House, in committees, as was the case with the member for St. Albert, who read extremely concerning comments into the record, it was erased. If the Whoever House made that mistake must that, have been a conservative. I haven't been following why this stuff very that long. Been? We're just because uh, nobody knew ahead in. of time what was happening. If they'd known, I'm sure that nobody in this House would have stood to applaud. I'm certain of that. This is Saga Malton. 
Mr. Speaker, in my writing of Mississauga Malton, I know that people are concerned about crime. And they want to know what our government is doing to make sure that people are safe. Quinder, Gahar, this is why I was pleased to see the House unanimously pass Bill C-48 Quinder? last week, which will help ensure that violent repeat offenders do not get bail. Can the Minister of Justice tell us more about this progress of this legislation and what the government is doing to improve My mom was right. A plain white shirt is a good look. Canada. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking my colleague from Mississauga Malton for that question and for his important advocacy. Repeat violent offenders Are don't belong the on the streets. Everyone in this chamber agrees on that proposition. As a government, we have a job to do in keeping people safe. That's, That's the face of justice in Canada. Of the House of Commons sitting this fall, we passed our bail reform legislation our plan for keeping people safe. MPs on that day put politics aside for the safety of Canadians. I like his title. the Senate will do the exact and his same cufflinks. and help make this bill become law. We need safe streets in this country. This bill is going to help us get there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. He's an original Mr. badass. Columbia Where's his watch Curry. upside down? Mr. Speaker, in British Columbia alone, mm -hmm. more than 1,600 people have died because of toxic, unregulated drugs since the start of this year. This summer, I traveled to Portugal, where I saw that things could be different. We could have a nationwide evidence-based plan, including decriminalization, harm reduction, treatment recovery and prevention services. But the Liberals would rather stand by their patchwork approach that's not working. So will this government right their wrongs by immediately delivering a compassionate and coordinated plan to respond to the toxic drug crisis? Those colours don't match. Addiction. At all, not even close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank She's my colleague bathroom. from the NDP. I just, the NDP I just came from the bathroom. Step by step in understanding that the toxic drug supply in this country is killing those who we love. Families, communities, no one is left unharmed by this, Mr. Speaker. But that's why we've taken a comprehensive approach, province by province, working with our counterparts to make sure that we are saving lives. Decriminalization in BC was the first step to that, but we need a responsible, compassionate framework that balances public health and public safety. I continue to work with, I continue to hope to work with him on this. And now I've got to leave, I'm going to the spa. That's why I'm wearing my bathrobe. Technology is crucial to the fight against climate change. In that fight, one of the Canada's leading agencies, Sustainable Development Technology Canada, has had allegations of wrongdoing with the way they've spent their funding and the way they have treated their staff. It's yet again another, another example of incompetency. For style, they black on black to is know good how too. The government makes decisions on spending for clean technology. The minister needs to release the full report in this house so Canadians can see the transparency they deserve and paid for. Whistleblowers stood up and risked their jobs with a minister to do the same thing and table the full report for all of this house and for Canadians. Yeah, here, here. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Speaker, I'd like to thank uh, my colleague for his question. Mr. Speaker, there, there's no point of trying to politicize everything that's happening, Mr. Speaker. The moment that we were alerted of, of allegation, Mr. Speaker, we asked for third-party reports report to investigate and to bring back a report. I can assure the member in this house and all Canadians that will look at the report, will take all the necessary actions, Mr. Speaker. We expect the highest standards of ethics and professionalism when it comes to agencies that are funded by the Government of Canada. Canadians can be reassured that we'll take all appropriate actions. And we have a question period today. Well, that sounds like that's question period for today. So I guess we'll wrap it up. It was pretty interesting. Do you guys want to see the way I wrap up the show like <clears throat> from back then? Because I kind of do. Like, So we're dropping right back into that. Uh, yeah, we're going to get out. Uh, that was quite a bit of fun. Um, Anyways, I'm going to be trying to do as many of these as I possibly can. Uh, I'm going to cut this one up now. Um, just I was doing this one live. We're going to learn about politics. Uh, we're going to have some fun making fun of these clowns in the sausage factory clown circus. Um, but that's it. Uh, we'll be back for the next one. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Oh, like, subscribe, all of that. Um, yeah, subscribe, like it, that'd be great. Okay, thank you.
So again, really, really green, like uh, no idea what I was doing. Still, I don't have a clue, guys. Not going to lie. You guys tune in, you watch. We're learning together and tolerating each other while we do. I'm excited for tomorrow. Uh, we are going to lighten the load. We're going to stop doing these three-hour shows. And I'm just going to come up with a very solid hour of something for tomorrow and uh, the rest of the week. And then we're back into the regular question periods. And I'll, I will give you a heads up. When those question periods come back, you will have never seen a live episode of question period done like this. I've got some tricks. I figured out how to take a live stream and be able to edit it on the fly. Wait and see next Monday. I'm telling you, Wednesday especially, tune in, because we are going to have the lights on on Wednesday. Monday is going to be pretty rocking too. Anyway, thank you all so much for hanging out. It's a blast. There's been some new people in the chat room today. I hope you like it. I love it. Like, we've got a couple of things that are just seeming to fall into place here that we have a group of people that are similar-minded, at least in their decency towards each other. And we have a couple of dissonance in the room. I do not mind that. That is good for learning. And that is the, that's what we're doing here. If nobody ever questioned anybody, like, well, progress would take a long time to, you know, advance. Anyway, I'm Aaron, Question Period Canada. Thank you all for hanging out. There are so many people. If I missed anybody, if somebody slipped in, I didn't get to say hello. Or, And also, I do find it confusing to put, like, a video of myself when there's already a video of myself on there. I've like to have two of me and then two of my voice that's just confusing so we try to minimize that anyhow we're out have something healthy to eat thank you all for tuning in to all the new members and subscribe or like people that just watched i don't know if you subscribed come back check us out like when the question periods come back we are going to have a different level of product you have no idea like what is he talking about come back next monday and you will see, I will have it here ready to show you live, 3 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time, so that's 2 p.m. Uh, Ontario, and then you can figure out time zones. We're out. Thank you all for watching. Catch you next video. It's been a long one. I've got to get something to eat. We're out, guys. <laughs>